Thank you very much to our host uh, of this three-in-one program, the Magister Aquaculture Study Program, Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, as well as uh, the, uh, the Aquatic Resources Management uh, Study Program, Mr. Dailami. Thank you uh, for all the committee. Thank you for having me here. I feel honored as a moderator for this first session. Dear uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and participants, my name is uh, Umizakia and I will be your moderator for the next guest, les guest lecture session. <clears throat> As probably uh, most of us knows, immunology is a branch of biology that covers the study of immune systems, which is defined as network for biological processes that protects an, an organism from disease. So it is an expected, uh, in an expected successful aquaculture sector, this knowledge will be certainly plays a very important role. So today, we will, have, we will be here more about this knowledge from our most reputable keynote speaker from University of Malaysia, Sabah, Professor Dr. Rosita Haja Sabawi. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Uh, Professor Rosita. Waalaikumsalam, Bu Umi. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. We meet again. <laughs> yeah, I hope you still remember we are met in the Sumber Pasir. Okay, but before we begin to give the time for Professor Rosita, please let me read her curriculum vitae for a while. Uh, Professor Rosita is from University of Malaysia Sabah and her expertise is in aquaculture, mostly. Among her 57 pages of curriculum fide, <laughs> sorry, Prof. Rosita, <laughs> I might only read the most important part. <laughs> uh, Prof. Rosita is now uh, the board of director and a director of Borneo Marine Research Institute, University of Malaysia Sabah. Sorry, and I'm, I'm no longer the, the director. Now I'm oh. no the director. Yeah, I'm I'm the dean for postgraduate uh, studies. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I will I will almost read it. <laughs> Prof Rosita is now the dean of Center of Postgraduate Studies, University of Malaysia Sabah. Supervise so many students <laughs> from postdoc a PhD, master and undergraduate students, a lot of them. <laughs> and with 10 intellectual properties, more than 50 awards and honors, national and international journal reviewer, more than 65 publications from national and international journal. Congratulations, Prof. Rosita. <laughs> With those busy schedules and still Prof. Rosita able to present some of her valuable knowledge here in this program with us. For that, we highly appreciate it, Prof. Rosita. May this lecture will give an increase in uh, knowledge and positive outcomes for our institution and especially for our students here. Uh, for your information, Prof. Rosita, um, the participants in here are our students from S1, from undergraduate program, and also from the postgraduate program in uh, Magister of Aquaculture. Without more delay, uh, the time is yours, Prof. Rosita, to uh, deliver your knowledge. The time for you is until about 11. Uh, wow, it's, it's, it's a very long time. <laughs> and uh, later on, uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the lecture around uh, 11 o'clock until about uh, 12 o'clock. 
I hope you can stand there, Rob Rosita. <laughs> we will be together for a long time to, uh, this morning. <laughs> do you know how many students do we have for this program? Um, I think it's around, um, most of the participants is a students, Prof. Rosita. I yeah, how, how many are there? More than 100? There are mixture of undergraduate and master, and right? Post yeah, and, uh, it's undergraduate and postgraduate okay. students. Right. I, I think more uh, around 100 uh, students okay. now present with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Me. Thank you. <laughs> the time is yours, Prof. Rosita. All right. Thank you. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. I, yes, um, yes. I just want to um, to uh, summarize my lecture for the for the uh, the whole week, yeah, from today until Friday. I have discussed the content with uh, Dr. Uun because some content I believe uh, I can be uh, quite general, so I don't want it to start later. I prefer the general content should be the first one, the first day, so that students will be able to relate easily if I start with more general content on, on uh, um, very general physiology of aquaculture animals. And then after that, only I start with a more um, <clears throat> specific topic as as requested by uh, um, by the uh, uh, program invitation. So today I will share on a very um, general topic. I I guess all students have went through this topic in your undergraduate or postgraduate years, I believe in biology maybe or physiology. So this yes. is just like a revision to, you know, just to get some more, <laughs> Uh, 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 revisit to the, the uh, um, subject so that we can uh, have a better uh, memory or remember, remember the facts about, about physiology in aquaculture animal, then we only we move to uh, tomorrow, for example, we will talk about effects of supplementation on immune system. And then on Wednesday, I was given a topic on application of fourth industrial revelation technology to marine aquaculture for future food. And then on Thursday, I will be talking about something quite general also on sustainable aquaculture. And Friday, I was given a topic on medicinal plants and animals. So I just modify a bit the topics uh, to suit uh, the... the uh, uh, my expertise and also the, the flow of the uh, sharing for the for the five days yeah yeah okay sure yeah hang on yeah okay this will be my um, first lecture on comparative physiology of aquatic animals again like i said a, a very <laughs> uh, general topics <clears throat> Okay, a uh, student, if you have to stop me, you want to ask something, even though we have, you know, a session letter, Q and answer, uh, a question and answer letter, I, I allow you to, to, you know, if you have to, you just raise your hand uh, online, not physically. <laughs> okay. Okay. What is comparative physiology? Two automobiles, they are both cars, but the little economy one with tiny wheels and engines operates quite differently than one more like a sports car. So meaning we are comparing cars. They are cars, they are the same thing, but still they have a, a, a specification. Uh, one small car and, you know, with a limited uh, speed, for example, and the other one is very, very, uh, uh, a different um, capacity like sports car. So meaning we are comparing the same thing, which is car, but different uh, capacity, different ability, or even different morphology in terms of uh, the shape of sports car, the shape of this tiny car, uh, uh, the volume of um, 
um, um, the engines, everything is uh, uh, quite different, though they function quite uh, uh, similar, which is to bring you to one point to another point. So uh, when it comes to comparative animal physiology, it is traditionally defined as the exploration of physiological principle through examination of the functional diversity among animal species. Okay, this is very familiar to everyone, I guess. I think you have memorized all the, <laughs> the parts of a fish, I believe. Um, this is the external anatomy for us to relate with, you know, the, the topics, the later topics by me or by other speakers. I think it's very important for you to look back your basic the fundamental of the subject. Um, here, I think I don't have to name one by one. Maybe I think uh, everyone knows what, what exactly these uh, organs for, right? The nerves or nostril, the eye, lateral line. We know that we have dorsal fin. Some fish have spiny ones, some stop red, some have both caudal fin, anal fin, the van, van is like, genital papilla, you know, the water exchange there, uh, even the eggs, you know, going through there, and then pectoral fin, pelvic fin, uh, gills, opercular mouth, these are all the external morphology or anatomy of a fish. Doesn't mean all this uh, um, morphology uh, um, present in all type of fish. They may be um, uh, not not very prominent or not uh, present at all. Okay, this is internal anatomy. Again, this is a revision. I think everyone knows uh, uh, what are the names of the internal organs of a fish. When you see from here, it's the mouth, brain, skull, gills, spinal cord, kidney, swim bladder, vertebrae, muscles, gonad, and then anus here, stomach, intestine, pyloric sica, gallbladder, liver, esophagus, heart. But when you open up a fish, I think everyone here has done their biology 101, dissecting a, fa a fish. Not all fish will have all organs displayed in this photo, yeah? Some may have different types of stomach, some may missing some of this organ, yeah? So this is a general anatomy of a teleos, a fish, yeah? Because it is important for you to remember the names of all these organ, then only you can relate with the process uh, uh, with other things that happening, the physiology, the effect of, for example, the next topic is on supplements. So it's important for you to remember what are the organs involved in receiving the nutrient and all that. Okay, this is also just terms, yeah? Uh, you need to remember what is the meaning of anterior, this part, yeah? Posterior, dorsal, ventral, this part, and lateral. Okay, let's go to the first um, anatomy, the mouth. Mouth of a fish located at the interior end of the body. The mouth is used to take food. It also plays a big role in getting water to the gills so that oxygen can be supplied to the body. The mouth of fishes might look different and have different kinds of teeth. These things depend on what they eat and how it hunts food. So I guess after, you know, spend some time with fish, you realize that fish is also like human, right? You have different mouths, different uh, uh, eyes according to your uh, uh, species in this case, yeah? So 
in 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 the case of fish it according mostly to their feeding behavior it will uh, the organ will normally resemble the feeding behavior of the fish one two three four five six i think you can guess what fish are there based on the mouth okay predatory fish generally you know the, the carnivorous fish have the largest mouth often spotting long sharp teeth because they need to tear the meat or the flesh of whatever they, they are given to like fish some species have mouth that can be extended allowing the fish to lengthen its effective reach to catch tasty morsels of food as it swims other species have specialized mouth parts that allow them to rest alga of rocks and branches and additional fish have mouth with teeth in the back nearly in their throat yeah inside the mouth they have teeth these pharyngeal teeth assist in holding and swallowing swallowing prey so in general mouth have three types superior or sometimes different terms is used supraterminal and mouths are after Terminal mouth points straight forward and then the most common mouth type, inferior or subterminal mouth are turned downward. I will show you the example of the uh, photo. The inferior mouth type is often found in bottom dwelling species such as the catfish. Okay, this is the example of superior mouth. Superior, the mouth, the, the jaw here, the the, the down one is oriented upward. And if you notice, the, the lower jaw is longer than the upper jaw. That is what we call superior mouth. Usually, this fish uh, fit at the surface. They don't fit at the bottom. They lie in wait for prey to appear above them. So easy if the prey is up here rather than prey down here. So they strike from below. Many species of fish with a superior mouth feed largely on insect. Like this, they like to feed insect. Yeah? Easy for them to catch. However, some may feed on other fish that swim near the surface. Some species with a superior the mouth have an elongated lower jaw that function much like scoop. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at this one. This is what we call terminal mouth. Most fish have this mouth than any other type, meaning this is most common type of mouth, terminal mouth, located in the middle of the head and point forward. Jaws are normally the same length fish having terminal mouth are generally midwater feeders however they can fit at any location you know not necessarily at the bottom or the, the the middle column or the surface they normally omnivores so they can eat anything that is available they typically feed on the move either grabbing bits of food that they pass or preying on other fish that chase that they chase down. It is quite common for fish with a terminal mouth to also have a protrusible mouth, which allows them to thrust the jaw forward when grabbing food. Most fish that feed on other fish have terminal mouths, which are more often hinged to allow them to accommodate the action of snatching and swallowing another swallowing another fish yeah they may also possess specialized teeth and in some cases an additional jaw mori eels are the example of this type of fish lah. they have a pharyngeal jaw placed well back in their throat okay let's see about inferior mouth Inferior mouth, in other words, is also called subterminal or ventral mouth. So if you look at the publication books or journal, if you 
came across with a term like subterminal, it also means inferior mouth or ventral mouth. It means inferior mouth. It the mouth is turned downward. The balik yang tadi ya, the the other way round. The lower jaw is shorter than the upper jaw, and the jaw will often be protrusible. Fish with inferior mouths are usually bottom feeders and often poses barbels. Yeah, that assist in locating food particles. Most members of the catfish family have inferior jaws, and many of them have a, a, a sucker mouth as well. The diet of this kind of fish with uh, inferior mouth includes algae, you know, uh, small invertebrates such as snails, as well as detritus and any food that falls to the bottom. Protrusible mouth. See, this is how it looks like, yeah? Protrusible mouth allows a fish to extend, yeah? Mouth part can be extended. Reaching or attempting to snatch prey or food particle. So this feature actually can be seen in all mouth types, but this is very, very prominent. Yeah? Fish with protrusible and hinge terminal mouth can create a vacuum when they open their mouth, thus sucking in their prey. Various species of fish may use a protrusible mouth while chasing down prey while other species quietly lie in wait for prey to pass by, then rapidly extend the mouth to snatch the hapless victim. Some species use this feature to engage in non-feeding activities. For example, this is kissing gurami. They are not actually kissing. Yeah, They are actually defending their territory against others of the same species. So, but you know, people use the term kissing gremis. Of course, they look exactly like, a, a, you know, they are kissing, but that actually the purpose is not for reproduction. It is for defense, you know, territorial acts. So although it may appear to be kissing to other gremis, it is a combative move to show its opponent who owns the space. So, uh, other species, such as some members of the sucker catfish, use a protrusible mouth to stay in place by attaching to a rock or other stationary object. Meaning to say, they will use the mouth to suck at a substrate so that they don't have to uh, uh, swim away or by current or anything. Meaning to say, they can stay there uh, just resting by attaching the mouth to a rock. This is sucker mouth. Sucker mouth are common feature in fish with inferior mouths. For example, catfish, such as the popular pectomus, which literally translates to folded mouth, use a sucker mouth to raft algae off woods or rocks. Yeah, they're eating, grazing uh, the, the algae. Some species use a sucker mouth to hold on to help them combat currents, like I said just now, yeah? By attaching itself to rock via its sucker mouth, it can stay where it wishes, even in a strong current. These sucker mouths are also protrusible, which allows the fish to extend its reach when sifting through the substrate for a food particle. Sucker mouths can also be used when defending territory or quarreling with other fish. So mouth is not only an organ for food intake, but also for defense Yeah, in some fish. Defense and also like just now attaching themselves for, for, for uh, uh, I mean, uh, to avoid a strong current. So mouth, uh, you have to know that not only for food intake, but also there are other functions. Are we good so far? Let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. Or if you have questions, let me check the chat box. 
<laughs> so right, uh, Prof. Rosita, okay. you All are right. in just uh, exact speed. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, the next one is elongated mouth. I think this is very familiar <laughs> fish to us, yeah? A greatly elongated snout is another kind of mouth adaptation. This type of mouth allows the fish to poke into small crevices and holes to find food. Yeah, uh, They may also use this mouth to dig through the substrate to reach buried food treasures. Some surface feeding fish also have an elongated mouth that allows them to scoop insect and food particles from the surface. Uh, freshwater species with elongated mouths include half-baked gas and pencil fish. Saltwater species include the needle fish and fish in the rest family. Okay, big mouth. Not only uh, uh, domestic animal have big, yeah, like chicken. They have a big or paru in our language. So the big mouth is an interesting but less common. It's quite true, yeah? It's not a common mouth type of aquaculture species except for this one, ikan buntal. This one is also known as a rostrum. In this design, the mouth consists of two very hard pieces that are hinge and come together in a scissor-like fashion. This allow them to crush hard shells out of invertebrate, meaning uh, this kind of uh, mouth is suitable for those eating uh, uh, bivalve or, or shell uh, fish. Puffer fish, both freshwater and saltwater species, and saltwater parrot fish poses a big type mouth. Okay, let's move to another important organ or anatomy, which is the eye. Eye of fish located on the interior end of the body, usually dorsal to the mouth. Eyes allow animal to see in water. Depending on fish, the eyes could be very big, very small, or somewhere in between. Most teleos fish have color vision. The eyes of uh, uh, salmon, yeah, trout, for example, this species Oncohincus mycus, they have three sensitivity peaks at 455, 5, 5, 5, 530, and 5, 625 nanometers. But there are also aquatic species like sharks and rays, they do not have color vision, meaning they cannot differentiate red or blue, anything looks the same to them. Okay. In general, if you see this structure, this is more or less the same uh, uh, structure like human eyes, right? But the only thing, unlike human, most fish adjust focus by moving the lens closer or further from the retina. Light will enter the eye at the cornea, yeah? And then passing through the pupil, to reach the lens. Most fish species seems to have a fixed pupil size, but elasmo branches like sharks and rays have muscular iris, which allows pupil diameter to be adjusted. Pupil shape varies and may be, uh, for example, circular or slit-like. So this is about the eye. See, this is a very uh, wonderful creature, underwater creature with different types of eye. Flounder, yeah, uh, our ikan sebelah, if, if uh, the Malaysian call it ikan sebelah, flounder, uh, this is, I think, mud skipper, goldfish. Can't remember of the name of this fish, but look at the eyes. They have different types of eyes. Okay, let's move to operculum. Operculum is located laterally on the interior end of the body. It is posterior to the mouth. The operculum is a bony plate that protects the fish gills and helps pump water through the gills 
so that oxygen can be taken up by the gills and delivered to the rest of the body. So if anything happened to the gills, the process of this will be disturbed. Yeah, respiration, uh, uh, water exchange will be disturbed. So operculum is an important organ. There is some fish that, you know, um, uh, losing operculum or some malfunction in the structure that will disturb the uh, uh, respiration or, or uh, water uptake, oxygen uptake uh, in, inside the water. Shark. Rays and relatives such as elasmobranch fishes lack the opercular series. I think uh, if you uh, imagine a shark, you can see, right? They don't really have this opercular. Instead, they have a series of gill slits, we call it, yeah, that perforate the body wall. Yeah, they respire there through the series of slit. Yeah, not, uh, there is no um, um, a structure like opercular in. Elasmo brown, including the rays. Okay, let's have a look at the pelvic fin. Pelvic fin is typically located ventrally on the body, anterior to the anal when it is present, meaning to say some fish may not have pelvic fin. Pelvic fin helps fish uh, to keep their balance in water. Typically, these rounded fins are used for turning and swimming. However, pectoral fins can look quite different and serve many functions. Some look like eggs and allow the fish to walk on the sea floor. Some pelvic fins are sucker-like and enable fishes to suction themselves onto various objects or even other organisms. So the red one is the pelvic fin yeah so different species have different shape and the location also uh, uh, more or less the same but uh, not exactly at the same spot like this one and some fish doesn't even have it yeah or even very small pectoral fins it is located laterally on the fish, posterior to the operculum. This fin can be used for changing direction and hovering just above the sea floor. They can also be modified to act as legs and help fish walk along the sea floor and fill out the environment around them. So this is the pectoral, the red one. This one, this one, this one, this one. Dorsal fin. Located, like its name, located dorsal on the body. The dorsal is used for steering, balance, and defense. You know, spines can be raised, poking predators that try to eat a fish. Yeah, they can become a kind of sword for them. Yeah, they, they can... Uh, defend themselves using the dorsal fin, especially when they use the, uh, remember just now, the fin, uh, uh, whether a soft ray or the hard ray one. So the hard ray can be uh, uh, rays, yeah? So fins can also have rays, of, of course, yeah? Anal fin. This fin is located on the ventral side ventral the anal fin is used for balance and steering you know steering right like just like when you drive your car you have steering so these are the fin that is used for this purpose not all fish have anal fins you see not all of them have anal fin but they can also if there is be very tiny and hard to see not well developed in, in some fishes. Okay, let's have a look at the caudal fin, also known as the tail, yeah, located at the posterior end of the body. Caudal fin propels the fish forward through the water column. It is how the fish swim. 
There are many different types of caudal fin, which can provide hints at how fast or slow or for how long a fish can swim. Okay, let's move to lateral line. I think everyone knows what lateral line is, right? It is a very important organ. It's a sensory organ of a fish. If you see morphologically, we thought that lateral line only appear from this end to this end. Actually, they are extended up to the uh, um, eyes area and the uh, jaw area also. So lateral line is located lateral, laterally on each side of the body. So both sides have uh, lateral lines. Lateral line is a sensory system, like I said, that enable fish to feel the vibration, the movement of the water. Fishes can feel where other animals, including predator, are coming from, even if they cannot see it. So again, I said lateral lines is very, very important organ of the fish. Yeah. So this is how it looks like when they do the section, they are a nerve here and then the pores and the canal that uh, run the detection. This is the uh, scanning electron microscope of this uh, uh, nerve and, and, and the, and the uh, um, cell involved in the lateral line. Okay. Scales. Scales are located laterally on the body. Of course, not all fish have scale, right? They protect, protect fishes from attacks, parasites, and injuries they could receive from brushing up against hard substrate. Scales are covered with slime layer, and slime layer is very important to the health of fishes. So tomorrow, we will cover this immune system the effect of supplement, some uh, uh, um, um, discussion will involve this, the slime. Yeah, so that's why I started with a very general topic today that you refresh your memory about the uh, physiology of, of the aquatic animal or of, of a fish. Yeah, so this is how uh, the scale, scale looks like of difference species this is salmon cycloid it call it this one tenoid in bass garfish it looks square genoid and sharp placoid they call it okay gills most fish poses gills on either side of their head Gills are tissues made up of feathery structures called gill filaments, providing a large surface area for exchange of gases. Apart from gas exchange, gills are also involved in ion regulation or small regulation, acid-base balance, ammonia excretion, hormone production, modification of circulating metabolites and immune defense. In filter feeding species such as sardines, the gills may also perform a feeding function. So not only for uh, uh, gas exchange, yeah? it can also perform or assist in feeding. Yeah? In, in this species, gills is used to assist feeding. Okay. Another important organ, of course, the brain. Um, I'm sure you've done your dissection on the brain of a fish. Yeah, how's the size? Very small, right? Fish brains are small. For example, brain of a trout is about a size of large pea. Kacang piece. Okay? So it's small. Yeah, the brain in teleos is formed from five compartments, which are from rost rostral to caudal, 
Helicephalon or forebrain contain two olfactory lobes and cerebrum. Diencephalum contain epithalamus, thalamus, hypothalamus, mesent Mesencephalon or midbrain contain two optic lobes which are connected internally with porous longitudinal, longitudinalis and medially with the torus semicircularis and optic tegmentum. Metacentephalum or hindbrain, cerebellum, and myolacentephalum or brainstem medulla, oblum, gata. So more or less this is how the brain uh, compartments look like. Pardon speaking. Okay, heart. The telios heart has four chambers. Blood returning from the fish blood enters the sinus venosus, a thin wall sac where the major vein coils. Blood then flows from the atrium to the ventricle. Strong contraction of the ventricle's thick muscular wall send the blood under pressure into the elastic bulbous arteriosus. From there, the blood flows into the ventral aorta and on through the gills. There are three valves in the heart to prevent backflow during the expansion of the pumping chambers. So this is how the heart looks like. Yeah, it has four chambers. Okay, liver. Fish liver appears as a key organ which controls many functions and plays an important role in fish physiology, both in anabolism such as in catabolism. The size, shape, and volume of liver are adapted to the available space between other visceral organs or general activity, sorry, general cavity. Although there are variation between the species, the liver of telios in general present three lobes. Okay, the spleen. Spleen is regarded as the second lymphoid organ. So tomorrow, when we discuss about effect of supplement on immune system, we will again touch about this organ. So lymphoid organ such as spleen is very, very important, even though it's only regarded as the secondary uh, uh, lymphoid organ. And almost all natosmes possess this organ in which adaptive immune responses are generated. <clears throat> the spleen is constructed to filtrate peripheral blood. Visceral arteries supply the organ, whereas the draining splenic vein join the hepatic portal system. Okay, pancreas. Among bony fissures, the pancreatic tissue is usually diffused in or around the liver. It's not very big, yeah? Uh, uh, when you dissect your fish, we may not be able to see the pancreas that well, yeah? Depending on species. In many of soft red bony fishes, pancreas is a distinct organ. So, kalau bony fishes, if bony fishes with soft red, maybe your chances to get a, a, a prominent structure of pancreas is very high. <clears throat> The pancreas secretes several enzymes that are active in digestion. In addition, the pancreatic is isolated, have the endocrine function of producing insulin. So pancreas, even though very small, the role in uh, uh, digestion is extremely important. And of course, uh, the endocrine function also. Gallbladder. It is a warehouse for the bile that is created by the liver. It's a storage for your bile. From here, the bile is sent to the stomach to help break down food. Differences in the gallbladder structure between fish species are related to diet. 
So meaning, again, like I said, um, feeding behavior will influence the organ morphology, the structure. Pyloric sica. Pyloric sica is actually a unique organ to fish and not seen in other vertebrates have been used as a taxonomic criterion for distinguishing between species. For example, in salmon and mugil, uh, they use uh, the presence or the shape of uh, pylorexica to determine the species. Cellular structure similar to intestine with well-developed muscularis may have cilia. <clears throat> Some researchers reported pyloric sica enhanced absorption of amino acid, carbohydrate, and lipid, but other researchers did not find the same effect. Lipid absorption, enzyme synthesis, and vitamin production have all been proposed as function of pyloric sica. So in other words, mostly pyloric sica is involved in digestion process and of course the absorption okay let's have a look at stomach fish stomach may be classified into four general configuration as you can see here one two three four a straight stomach with an enlarged lumen as in Esox. You can Google what, what kind of fish is Esox. A use shape stomach with enlarged lumen as in Salmo, Corrigonus, and Clupia. The absence of a stomach as in Cyprinae, Gobidids, Cyprin, Cyprinodons, Gobis, Blennies, Carrot, and many other fish some families of which which only one genus lack of stomach and the last one is a stomach shape like y which is the d like a y on its side and the stem of the y forms a cordially directed cecum as in elosa angula uh, the true cord and ocean but so Straight stomach, uh, U-shape, this one, this one, the stomach, yeah? This is stomach, the U, straight, U, and this one, where? Missing, absent, no stomach, non-stomach, or stomach less. And this one, Y, looks like Y the Y alphabet. Intestine, or also called mid-gut. Intestine has distinctive epithelial, absorptive and secretory cell, active digestion and absorption process happening in mid-gut or intestine. Separated from hindgut with illocical valve. As short as 20% of body length and can be more than 20 times of body length for herbivores. As the length increases, the intestine changes direction, can be coiled, for example. Differ from other vertebrates by lacking a distinct colon, meaning large intestine. Two sources of enzyme for the mid-gut, the pancreas and the secretory cell in the gut wall with the pancreas perhaps secreting the greater variety and quantities of enzymes in fish. Because of the variety of enzymes present in different species, there have been some attempts to correlate enzyme activities in diet much remains to be learned about intestinal digestion in fish, meaning to say so many things that we haven't understand or know yet. You know, there are many things that we haven't studied, we haven't, 
be able to understand, to investigate. Science still don't know so many things, yeah? Trypsin appear to be the predominant protease in the midgut. You remember the enzyme for protein? The occurrence of at least one lipase. Enzyme for lipid may be in, assumed in all fishes and has been demonstrated for a number of species. Regardless of origin, some kind of lipase is essential to fish because fatty acids are essential dietary components for fish. Generally, amylase activity in fish is very weak compared with that in mammals. Okay, this is uh, just a comparison of uh, relative activity levels of amylase and trypsin, the enzyme yeah, in selected cyprinates, this different species here. Yes, Cardinius feeding habit is herbivore. So amylase activity is 1 compared to trypsin is 0 0.4. Amylase, trypsin, 2.5 quite high. Blica omnivorous amylase is 1.1, trypsin 0 0.9, amylase trypsin 1.2. Alburus is also omnivorous, amylase 1, trypsin also 1, 0 0.9, amylase trypsin 1.1. Aspias, meanwhile, is carnivorous. Amylase activity is quite Low, very low compared to the rest of the species. But trypsin is quite high and amylase trypsin also, sorry, very low. Cyprinus is omnivorous. Amylase trip activity is very high. And trypsin activity 1.7, quite high also. Amylase trypsin is 3.4. Okay, let's have a look at the hindgut. This is actually an extension of midgut where the pH near neutral here. Gradually diminishing digestive absorption, absorptive function involved in osmoregulation, yeah, hindgut. Okay. Okay. These are the strategies to increase digestive surface area in, in the digesters, uh, digestive system to lengthen the intestine common in omnivorous. You see this one? It is very, very long, meaning it will provide large surface area for nutrient absorption, herbivores. Development of thick mucosa common in carnivorous fish. So this one also will help to increase surface area. And development of diverticula in a form of pyloric sica. So another, if you go back just now, the function of pyloric sica is just to also increase the surface area for a better absorption. The presence of internal epithelial fold, yeah, this also uh, present in some species. Pepsin is the predominant gastric enzyme of all vertebrates, including fish. Optimal pH for maximal proteolytic activity has been reported for several species, for example. For pike or plies, you can um, Google if you want to see how the pike or plies looks like. pH 2 for proteolytic activity, pH 3 to 4 for ectellurus, pH 1.3 and 2.5 to 3.5 for salmon or maybe similar to tuna as well. Peptic activity has been shown in a number of cultured and commercial species, including Angula japonica, 
Tilapia Mozambica, Pleuronectis, both salmon and Oncohincus species, Ecalurus, Micropterus, Lep Lepomis, and Perca. Okay, let's have a look at absorption. A complex mixture of different processes needed to absorb the diverse foodstuffs that are ingested. So when fish take food from their mouth and going to the stomach and digested there with the help of several enzymes, then this need to be absorbed. Okay. Process range from a simple diffusion to active transport of specific molecules to bulk uptake of proteins and lipid. Most research uh, have done on absorption is on amino acid uptake. So most, uh, sorry, most absorption, uh, most. Most nutrient were absorbed by the time they reached the middle of the intestine, except that tyrosine was poorly absorbed because of competitive inhibition. Research on lipid digestion in fish requires gas, liquid, and other chromatography to sort out major groups of lipid. So if you are interested in, in this research for your project, uh, um, you can uh, use GC or G GCMS to do uh, uh, this kind of study. Lipids taken up by the intestinal and cecal epithelium, partly as fatty acid, mostly as mono and diglyceride, and partly as droplets, and uh, somehow transferred into blood and limb vessel. So much of the carbohydrate transport has been tested by measuring the uptake of glucose. If you check the articles, journal articles, publication on, on how fish utilize carbohydrate or the transport of carbohydrate, many people or researchers doing or measuring the uptake of glucose, similar to a, a human, right? We, if we have issue with our blood sugar or anything like that, we will use the um, glucose measurement or, or um, uh, monitoring uh, uh, tests uh, re related to this uh, um, glucose. Okay, the examples uh, in the previous slide are mostly on fish, so I, I decided to put some slide on shrimp. Okay, prey is detected by the first chile and transferred to the mouth parts. Yeah, if you remember what is chile, and then uh, I will show you some uh, a video later on. The maxillae and maxillipate are adapted to enmesh and hold the prey prior to ingestion. Large items of food are crushed or cut by mandibles, while non-food items are rejected. Secretion of mucus from glands are added to the food mass and then pushed into the esophagus. After ingestion, food enters the stomach and mixed with digestive enzymes and then ground in a gastric meal. Larger particles are retained for further processing while fine particles pass into the digestive gland. Indigestible material pass from the stomach into the meat and hind guts prior to excretion. Okay, this is the shrimp external anatomy. I'm sure you have gone through this in your biology class. Yeah, these are different, uh, uh, quite different from teleos or from the fish, right? They have eye, they have flagellate, they have antennal, scaphoceride, this one. Yeah, this is, of course, rostrum. Uh, okay, this is interesting. The name of these appendages, yeah? First maxillipate, second maxillipate, third maxillipate, chile. Yeah, Chile. I want you to try to uh, uh, remember this 
parts because I would like to show you the video later on so that you can tell which uh, appendages that is used to, to, to take food and then to, to, to put it in the mouth. Yeah, this is periopod or legs, petasma, paleopod, pleuron, europod, this is calcium, endopod, exopod. Yeah, this is the internal anatomy. The brain, stomach is in the head, heart also, this head part, ovary also, yeah, mouth, posterior aorta, intestine, anus, rectum, nerve cord, pitasma, digestive gland. So this part is quite an important uh, um, section of the uh, body of a shrimp because it house important organ here the ovary which is for reproduction the heart for circulation you know stomach digestive system brain for your endocrine everything the nervous system so it is a very very unique uh, um, aquatic animal where whereby this head part yeah is a, a, a place to house so many important organs. Unlike the fish, it is quite, uh, um, uh, what do you call, uh, distributed evenly throughout the body. Okay, within the digestive gland, this is still on shrimp, yeah? There is a range of specialized cells. This is in digestive gland of a shrimp. That is what we call F cell. This is unique to shrimp. They call it F cell. F cell secret enzymes, R cells and B cells absorb and store nutrients. The digestive process in shrimp is generally rapid within four to six hours at 20 degrees Celsius might be faster if you culture your shrimp in higher temperature. Meaning if it's rapid, you need to feed them frequently, right? Otherwise, after four hours, for example, they will become hungry because of already food digested or, or already. So about four to six hours is the digestion uh, occur in uh, shrimp digestive system. Limited ability to store food coupled to a rapid digestive process means okay that actively growing shrimp must feed more or less continuously. So by knowing the basic, the physiology, the biology of aquaculture animals will help you a lot in the aquaculture farm. Why do you think you want to feed your shrimp many times? You don't know. But, you know, by having knowledge like this, it's a basic knowledge, but it will help you a lot. Whether you are one day become an entrepreneur of fish production or a fish farmer, educated fish farmer, of course, or even an educator, you must know the subject very well. Why do you want to feed your shrimp so many times a day? This is one of the reasons. Because like you uh, uh, can see in the uh, anatomy, the digestive system is, is located in the head part. Everything is in the head part. The brain in the head digestive system also in the head. This one. Remember, the heart is in the head, stomach is in the head, brain is in the head. So, they have very limited ability to store food. Not so much space, right? Coupled with a rapid digestive process, very fast, within four hours. Yeah? They digest the food, meaning you need to feed your shrimp 
uh, continuously or frequently. That is the reason, especially the growing, meaning the the juvenile, not the, the matured or, or the, the like rootstock, the, the grow out. Okay. Hang on. I want to show you this a simple video. Give me some time, yeah? I need to copy this, but I don't know how to copy. How do I copy this? I guess you have, you, maybe you, you block this. Um, oh. That's right. Yeah, you block that okay, okay. and then put it in a. Yeah, yeah, I, I know now. Yeah, uh, and then put it, uh, okay. Okay. Yes, I think that. Yeah. Okay. This is in, I think, from Indonesia also. I found this in YouTube. <laughs> Look at the appendages. Which one? What is the use of this? Appendages. Okay. Yeah. So I I just want you to relate. With Sell this. online and grow your business with Wix e-commerce. Create a beautiful storefront for your. Sorry. Okay. I just want you to relate with this one. If you notice this this one, the pleopod were used to keep the shrimp float moving, right? But only this part is used for feeding. So it is a very unique uh, creature, I would say. Okay, let's move to swim bladder. Swim bladder, or some people call it a bladder. It's a buoyancy organ. Yeah, most bony fish will have swim bladder. It is located in the body cavity and derived from an outpocketing of the digestive tube. Swim bladders may be filled with either air or oxygen, thus playing a key role in maintaining neutral buoyancy and lowering energy costs for fish to remain at a certain depth. In some species, such as the pirachutra, Piraruchu arapaima gaigas, the swim bladder is highly vascularized and function as a respiratory organ. You know the arapaima gaigas, right? The one from Amazon. It's very big fish. So the swim bladder is function as respiratory organ, very, very well developed, vascularized. So um, there is a relationship between swim bladder and hearing ability of fish. So interesting, right? Uh, that we know, we thought that swim bladder is only to, for, for the fish to, to float, but it also has some influence on the hearing ability. Okay. <coughs> Respiration. Respiration in fish takes place with the help of gills. 
Okay, the previous slide, I think, hang on ya, all the slide the previously is on the organs. Now we move to the process, the physiology process. No longer the organs, yeah, but the process. <coughs> Respiration in fish takes place with the help of gills. No, excuse me, yeah. I, Fish take in oxygen-rich water via their mouths and pump it over their gills. When water moves over the gill filaments, the blood within the capillary network takes up the dissolved oxygen. Then the circulatory system supplies oxygen to all tissues of the body and finally to the cells while taking up carbon dioxide that is eliminated through the gills from the body. It exits the body of the fish. Once the water moves past the gills through the openings provided in the sides of the throat or through the operculum, a flap usually found in bony fish that the covers the pro and protects the fish gill. <clears throat> So this is actually uh, the diagram of what happened during respiration. Yeah. Um, if you can see, this is the gill arch, um, or operculum. Like I said, um, this is where water intake and then move through the gills. In in the gills, you see there is the oxygen rich oxygen poor similar concept with us the human okay so these are the lamella the water flow between the lamella and then the blood flow through capillaries in lamella so and then if you see this is counter current exchange water flow showing oxygen percentage blood flow in simplified capillary showing percentage of oxygen so the blue one is for uh, poor uh, oxygen uh, blood and the, the red one is the oxygen rich blood. So this is just a general <clears throat> um, process of respiration. Okay, let's have a look at the process of circulation. Fish have a closed circulatory system with a heart that pumps blood around the body in a single loop from the heart to the gills, from the gills to the rest of the body, and then back to the heart. The atrium collects blood that has returned from the body and the ventricle pumps the blood to the gills where exchange occurs and the blood is reoxygenated. This is called gill circulation. The blood then continues through the rest of the body before arriving back at the atrium. And then this is what we call systemic circulation because it involves the system, other system yeah, from the atrium, the, the heart, and then the body. Meanwhile, this one, the circulation happening around the gills only. This unidirectional flow of blood produces a gradient of oxygenated to deoxygenated blood around the fish systemic circuit. The result is a limit in the amount of oxygen that can reach some of the organs and tissues of the body, reducing the overall metabolic capacity of fish. Okay. Digestion. Digestion is the process of mechanically and enzymatically break down food into substances for absorption into the bloodstream. Why mechanically? Because you remember when the fish or the shrimp take the food item, they will use mechanical, right? Like their hand, I mean, the, what do you call the appendages, the chile. Uh, and then put into the mouth, break with the, in, in the case of fish, they use teeth to crush 
the food and then only when it enters the system the enzyme will take place i mean uh, the, the function so digestion process involved mechanically also yeah mechanically and enzymatically breaking down food this generally means that proteins are hydrolyzed to amino acid or to polypeptide chains of a few amino acid digestible carbohydrate to simple sugars and lipid to fatty acid and glycerol this is digestion yeah break down the larger molecule into smaller molecules materials not absorbed are by definition is indigestible and eventually avoided as feces so when we use feed that is highly undigestible it will not be converted into fish tissue which is not not very good for manila meaning to say fcr will be very inefficient you will end up very high value fcr because of the feed is highly undigestible digestibility ranges from 100% for glucose because it is the simplest form of sugar to as little as 5% for raw starch or 5 to 15% for plant material containing mostly glucose digestibility uh, a study is uh, is quite uh, easy to, to to perform in in your lab you just need inert marker like chromic oxide you add it into the formula if you want to determine digestibility of certain ingredients and then you you collect the feces of your fish and then you analyze for the nutrient then there's formula to derive the digestibility or apparent digestibility coefficient digestibility of most natural proteins and lipids ranges from 80 to 90 percent depends on what type of protein plant protein may be slightly lower than the animal proteins but in general for lipid digestibility most fishes have ability to digest lipid efficiently digestion is a process a progressive process beginning in the stomach and possibly not ending until food leaves the rectum as feces okay endocrine physiology endocrine actually is a huge topic we can have one book one thick book on fish endocrinology it's not a, 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 a straightforward um, uh, what do you call process fish endocrine is uh, quite uh, comprehensive yeah because it is involving different organ when you said endocrine physiology it doesn't involve one organs endocrine system is a set of organ and tissues of dissimilar origins structure and location these organs secrete hormones via the blood stream to reach distant organ hormones are signaling molecules that regulate many physiological and behavioral functions including growth reproduction and balance the endocrine mediates four types of effects one is kinetic pigment migration meaning metabolic carbohydrate balance morphogenic sexual differentiation and behavioral reproductive migration this is a picture of uh, organ or system of endocrine pituitary um, i'm not sure if you have your lab on how to extract pituitary for hormone induced spawning for your aquaculture we can extract pituitary gland from your fish and then convert it into the 
uh, um, solution we extract and then we take it a uh, converted solution and then we inject to fish for induced breeding pineal gland chromaffin tissue corpuscle of stenius gonad urophysis intestinal mucosa pancreatic islet ultimocranchial body then thyroid so all these are part of endocrine system of a fish so when we discuss about endocrine physiology we will have to go through one by one how this organ uh, involve and their roles in uh, uh, um, modulating the process yeah the the structure what the type of hormone and then how how do they uh, uh, function how they uh, um, uh, signaling everything the, the, this this uh, um, uh, topics it's a very huge topic so i just put them in a summary in one slide just to give you an overview what i'm sure you have learned about endocrine knowledge of fish <coughs> excuse me prof rosita yeah i think you already have like uh give your lecture around uh, 75 minutes oh okay uh, would you like to pause for a while yeah for i think questions I probably like, yeah please please if, if anything uh, the student need to ask or yeah i don't mind if if you, they want to take rest because i understand student they cannot you know go on too long otherwise they can really absorb much we may want to have some break in between i i would suggest Dr. Yeah. umi yes thank you bro uh, uh, yeah. yeah i think you uh, you already delivered uh, quite a lot of knowledge <laughs> for this 75 minutes i hope the students are uh Still awake. Or wake up <laughs> and, <laughs> and already make a note for that but yeah, for information, for your information, the students or the participants here are uh, include the undergraduate and also the postgraduate okay. students. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Yeah, uh, I saw one raised hand. So okay. uh, probably I will just give uh, the first chance to Mr. Gil Gomez to deliver the questions. Would you like to deliver it yourself? In the hang on, yeah, sorry, sorry. So much for the time. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. My my full name is uh, Guillermo Teotonio Gomez. Uh, just call me Gomez. I am from Timor Leste. Uh, oh, okay. I'm student, uh, mag magister's degree students in aquaculture. Okay. Uh, I'm very pleased to join this uh, program three in one. Yeah, this is the second time I am joining this program. Congratulations. Uh, I have uh, two questions for the prof uh, uh, who presented in this uh, uh, lecture, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Rosita. The, the first one is uh, regarding to the picture in the last, uh, in the beginning of the, this uh, presentation, you saw us about the one picture from the sea bus. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, each of the tissue body in the fish body, they will do uh, uh, is Function. Uh, for example, uh, like uh, a, it's function want to see around, to see the prey, to see the situation. My question is, uh, if the condition in the light condition, uh, I think it's okay. But how about the dark condition? The the fish still use the Egg for the see around, see the situation, see how maybe they 
they maybe the fish in the dangerous situation if the dark dark uh, condition uh, which ones the tissue they will use they still use a uh, egg or different uh, tissue this is the first uh, question the second question about the uh, sea bass or lattice calcal river we know that uh, regarding to tip type of the mode we will identify identification that uh, that fish is will a bit is uh, carnivore. They will use the mode to, to capture the prey. But as we know, the this one is uh, the life in the wild, the natural. But if we already cultivation in the uh, rearing in the floating net or in the pond. I think uh, uh, every uh, most important we give food them with the pellet and uh, with the pellet. How about the, the food is still like uh, in the natural or different? Thank you, madam. This is my yeah. question. I hope you uh, explain it clearly to me. Thank you for opportunity. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, Prof. Rosita, do you get the uh, questions? Yeah, it's Gusti, right? Are you Gusti? No? No, it's Gil. I'm Gil Gomez. Gomez. Oh, Gomez. Sorry. I'm Gomez from okay. Timur Leste, madam. All right. Okay, I try my best to answer. Okay. Um, I, if I get you right, your first question is whether fish can see in the dark, right? Is it correct? Yeah, correct, madam. Okay. Um, all fish have some level of night vision, you know, meaning they have this some chemicals in their eyes that allow them to see some ultraviolet frequencies at different wavelengths. So um, if fish living in the deep sea, meaning they navigate in a complete darkness, it's not strictly seeing, but you remember fish have different um, sensory organs like their lateral lines. So they may not be see using their eyes, but they do have other organ who can sense what is happening around them. So um, depending on what uh, uh, wavelength under the water, fish might be able to see with their eyes, but definitely reduce with the depth of the water, but still they can navigate even though they don't use the, the eyes anymore in the dark. I, I hope I answer your questions, yeah? Meaning to say, if us human being, if my, our eye is, you know, you, you close your eye, it's very hard for us to walk, right? Because we really depend on our eyes to see. Unlike fish, fish, they have or given other form of sensory or even for, for seeing, you know, it, it's not 100% depending on their eyes. In, in underwater, they will be able to see, it depends on how deep and, and depends on the species, but there are other organs will help them to navigate. Okay. Okay. Uh, second question. Sorry, I don't really get your second question. You said the sea bus rearing ah, in the cage. The, huh? yeah, yes, madam. The second question is a uh, uh, sea bus. Uh, when we, I, we see the tape of the moat, this is a carnivore fish. Uh -huh. And they use the tooth to ca to capture the prey in the wild. Yeah. But uh, after we cultivation uh -huh. in the barn or in the uh, uh, aquaculture the, system, probably uh, aquaculture system, we will use the pellet. The the okay. still uh, the uh, the function of the mood still like in the uh, in the wild or different, madam. Thank you. Because uh, what what they have, for example, sea bass, the types of food will not change their morphology. <laughs> I mean, if they are in the wild, that is the kind of teeth, the kind of jaw they have. Of course, when we culture them in our aquaculture system, uh, morphology will not change. The only thing is the food given to them will be different. For example, in the wild, they are hunting fish, but 
when we culture, we're giving them pellet. So to me, they will have no, uh, what do you call, uh, um, rather than um, tearing the meat of the fish, they don't have to spend so much energy to chew the pellet, for example. The, the, the only difference is the way they, 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 they consume the food, but the, the challenges is not there, you know. The challenges when you feed with pellet is the palatability, meaning the attractiveness of the pellet itself. Because it's not natural diet, they don't have the, set, the same smell like fish, the, 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 the right taste, the fish taste like, you know, fish or other are the aquatic animals that they used to eat in the in the cage or in the aquaculture system we are giving them pellet number one issue is the palatability how nice or how enak is the food to them that that yeah. is the main issue in uh, any fish culture not only sibas so um, okay. yeah that that is my answer for you Okay, uh, okay. Can, can we go through the question in here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Prof. In, there's still several questions, but not. I guess probably I will just limit it for uh, a few more and then you can continue again. And then later on, you can pause again, for instance, like that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, it, uh, this is the second question from chat. Uh, I will read it for you. Uh, from Putri Ananda. Putri Ananda asks, uh, how gills play a role in immune defense? Prof. Rosita. Okay, hang on, yeah. Yeah. Gills. This question is about gills. Okay. Um, if you remember the earlier slide, just now I show you about um, mucosal. Um, mucosal uh, on the on the scale, right? Same thing yeah. with the gill. Gill also is covered with mucos, mucosa, and mucos mm. is another form of immune system of fish. Yeah. So this is how the so-called uh, first layer to uh, fight pathogen. Yeah. Uh, in in yes. other words, lah. Because that this uh, um, fish has inner immune system and specific immune system and all that. Tomorrow we will cover that one. So yeah, yeah, we, we can discuss further. But in general, gills they have a layer, a mucous okay. layer that, mucous. that we have yeah. as yeah, yeah, as immune system. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. That's um, that's a very uh, straight answer, and yeah, I think it's uh, really clear. Okay, for the next question is from Ikustila Nang Prastawan Aditya Putra. Okay, for those uh, students, please uh, mention that you are in S1 or S2. Probably they will be uh, clearer later. Uh, Ikustila Nang uh, Prastawan Aditya Putra wants to ask you about what organ that is responsible for the most for osmoregulations. Okay, uh, when we talk about osmoregulation, you have to understand what is osmoregulation. It is a process of maintaining an internal balance of your body in terms of your body fluid, the salt and the water. And then what are the organs involved in this kind of process, the balancing of the water inside the body? And, and of course, the uh, uh, when I said the uh, um, the balance is about not only water per se, but there are also in in the case of fish maybe the the mm. salt. Yeah. So when we talk about organ, skin is involved in osmoregulation, and of course the kidney. So these two are uh, um, uh, very important organ in osmoregulation. Okay. Okay, I guess uh, there's already three um, questions. Um, uh, before um, we continue with uh, another questions, would you like to proceed with your lecture, uh, Prof. 
Can, can we have like 10 minutes break? I need to go to the washroom. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. So of course. Will, yeah, we it's almost 11 now. So we come back at 11.10. Sorry, it's my time. So your time oh, okay. will be... Your time. What is your time now? It's ten o'clock, right? It's, uh, yes, it's ten a.m. here in okay, Malang. So we, we come back at ten ten like that. Oh, of course. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so you. we just have a break for ten minutes. Yeah. Can thanks. Okay, uh, Professor. Um. Uh, yeah. So, uh, dear students, um, especially for the one who already delivered the questions, um. Please just wait uh, a second or patiently, your question will be delivered. Uh, especially for Muhammad Isan Tanjung, yeah, uh, we will ask the, your questions later when we come back from the break. So we have a break for uh, 10 minutes, but please just don't leave uh, because the lecture will continue until about, um, yeah uh 12 mostly but if it uh, will stop before that it's it's fine so there will be uh, still plenty of time for you to ask a question about this okay so we will have a break uh, about 10 minutes uh, mr delami probably uh, you can um, play a video or something like that um, i think will be great uh, to just <laughs> let the time pass for 10 minutes. My second one, probably, do you have any interesting video? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting video for uh, what? Uh, the study program, probably. Uh, or, oh, yeah. I just have a faculty profile, maybe. <laughs> 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 yeah, we just have to wait for 10 minutes for Prof. Rosita to come back. Um, yeah, why not? I heard that uh, there, is, uh, there are uh, quite um, interesting videos that you might want to share with us by one. Okay, I'll wait please. Okay, dear all students and all the participants of this uh, three uh, guest lecture in three in one program. Uh, while we are waiting for uh, Prof. Rostita, we will see uh, a short video from Pai Huan. Enjoy, please enjoy. Sorry, uh, Pak Delami, please uh, give me access to share my screen. Uh, uh, I think you already have the access. Uh, maybe because yeah. the share screen from Prof. Rosita. Oh. Oh, I see. Yeah. Unfortunate owner. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Jaya adalah kampus tujuan Universitas Brawijaya adalah kampus tujuan paling favorit di Indonesia. Para mahasiswa datang dari berbagai daerah di Indonesia serta dari luar negeri. Universitas Brawijaya semula merupakan yayasan perguruan tinggi berdama yayasan perguruan tinggi Malang pada tahun 1958. 
Terletak di pusat kota Malang yang terkenal dengan hawa yang segar dan udara yang sejuk, Universitas Brawijaya telah menciptakan lingkungan kampus yang asri. Dengan tata ruang yang terpelihara dengan baik dan didukung oleh tenaga pengajar yang berkualitas, baik dari dalam maupun luar negeri, menjadikan Universitas Brawijaya sebagai kampus yang nyaman dan kondusif untuk proses belajar dan mengajar, serta untuk mengembangkan bakat dan minat. Universitas Brawijaya membuka akses belajar yang seluas-luasnya bagi calon mahasiswa berbakat, termasuk mahasiswa disabilitas. Saat ini, ribuan lebih mahasiswa mendapatkan beasiswa dari berbagai instansi, baik pemerintah maupun swasta. Universitas Brawijaya memiliki 14 fakultas, pasca sarjana, dan program vokasi. Dengan didukung lebih dari 140 guru besar dan 400 dosen peneliti yang berpengalaman mengajar dan meneliti di berbagai bidang ilmu pengetahuan, teknologi, sosial, budaya, dan humaniora, Universitas Brawijaya siap mengembangkan proses pendidikan yang bermutu dan berstandar internasional untuk menghasilkan lulusan berdaya saing global. Untuk menunjang kompetensi dan keterampilan mahasiswa, Universitas Brawijaya menyediakan berbagai laboratorium dengan peralatan yang berteknologi canggih dan modern, termasuk laboratorium lapangan, sehingga budaya penelitian yang kuat terus berkembang ditandai dengan penemuan inovatif yang bermanfaat bagi masyarakat luas. Karya ilmiah yang bermutu dan inovasi diciptakan sivitas akademika sebagai wahana pendidikan, penelitian, dan pengabdian kepada masyarakat. Sebagai perwujudan komitmen sebagai World Class Entrepreneurial University, berbagai sarana dan prasarana serta beragam wahana bagi berbagai aktivitas mahasiswa disediakan untuk menjamin terciptanya peserta didik yang unggul dan berprestasi. Banyak lulusan Universitas Brawijaya yang saat ini menempati posisi penting dan berkontribusi nyata di Indonesia maupun di tingkat internasional. Dari pengajarnya dulu zaman saya kuliah banyak praktisinya, jadi saya ngerasa benar-benar kepakai banget bukan cuma belajar teori tapi prakteknya kita dapat. Dari pengalaman kuliah yang paling berkesan ya karena saya anak organisasi jadi ya di kepanitiaan terus uh, saya di sana belajar tentang kepemimpinan. Dulu yang depan saya itu fakultas peternakan, sekarang udah berapa lantai ya? Malah ada liftnya, dulu nggak ada. Dengan semangat kami, Universitas Brawijaya akan menunjukkan kepada dunia pendidikan yang berintegritas dan humanis serta berada pada barisan terdepan dalam pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan dan teknologi. Dengan banyak hati dan penuh percaya diri, lulusan Universitas Brawijaya siap menyongsong masa depan Holding Up Global Future. Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science originate from the Marine Fisheries College founded on October 28, 1962 by the Probolinggo Education Foundation. October 28 became the anniversary celebration of Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science. Through the ministerial degree number 163, Year 1963, Marine Fisher College joined us Department in Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Husbandry, Universitas Brawijaya, based in Mala. In 1982, the Faculty of Animal Husbandry and Fisheries was separated into two faculties, Faculty of Animal Husbandry and Faculty of Fisheries. To produce professional graduates that can apply the principle of exploration, exploitation, and management in fishery and marine resource, the Faculty of Fisheries has changed to the Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science based on the degree of Rector number 041-SK-2008. 
Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science as a vision to become a superior higher education institution with international standard by applying fisheries and marine entrepreneurial strategy and be able to play an active role in the nation development through the process of aligning education, research, and community service. Welcome to the Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science Unit. Okay, uh, thank you for Ayang. the video just... Um, Ayang. Ayang tutup the paper. Mungkin enggak? Just for the uh, past, uh, the time. Okay, okay. The time. Uh, Professor Rosita, oh, are you already oh, available? Yeah, yeah, I'm back. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, would you... Okay. Yeah. Uh, welcome back again, Prof. Rosita. Um, actually, after I read the last question, um, it's related with your really uh, beginning of your lecture. Would you mind just uh, uh, answer this first last questions just for this session? No, I mean from the first session. Do you mind, Prof. Rosita? Yeah, yeah. Which one? Yeah, which question? Uh, okay, I will just read it because this is related to the uh, your first uh, slide uh, or the beginning of the slide. The question is from uh, Muhammad Is Ihsan Tanjung. Uh, as we already know that um, the stomach, uh, the fish stomach, is classified into four general configurations, right? Uh, what is the purpose of those different configuration? for fish. Are those related to fish diet or something? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Terima kasih, Bu Umi. Um, yeah. Muhammad Ihsan, actually you have answered your own question. It is related <laughs> to fish diet and the feeding behavior of the fish. fish. Yeah? Uh, okay. <laughs> It reflects the feeding behavior and also what are they eating. Uh, God created it that way so that they can graze the algae at the bottom or catching the face, the surface. So very good. You, you have answered your own question <laughs> related to the diet. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So hopefully this will answer your own questions, Mr. Muhammad Isan Tanjung. Okay, Prof. Rosita, I think you uh, are welcome to continue your lecture today. Um, until about uh, 11 or 11 uh, 15 okay. something like that and then uh, we will have the last uh, session for question again sure thank you I don't, I don't have many slide left but i will share whatever i have okay i share now oh okay um then um will be uh, just flexible okay. i mean if you're okay. ready for questions then please let us know i, I, I still have uh, a few slides okay so okay. we will continue on nervous system so nervous system in fish is the primary mechanism to coordinating in integrated integrating body activities yeah nervous system is always about coordination yeah the stimuli are received by the nervous system through sense organs Functioning of nervous system based on the electrical properties of its functional units, neurons. So it's basically, you know, uh, uh, similar to a, a human, yeah? Neuron also in our body involves in our nervous system. Uh, nervous system is derived from ectoderm. If you remember the word ecto is uh, the outer part of the skin. Nervous system is div divisible into central uh, nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and autonomous nervous system. Okay. Still on the nervous system, nervous and endocrine system are interdependent but often act jointly. We have covered the previous slide on endocrine, right? But both endocrine and nervous system are two different systems, but they normally act jointly, meaning they have connection when the body functioning. They both transmit signals to effector organs, but those transmitted by nervous system 
are of electric nature and travel fast with endocrine system, travel slow and hormonal. So this is the major difference between the nervous and endocrine. Nervous always, you remember, is very electric nature, travel very fast. But endocrine normally related to hormone. When related to hormone, they travel quite slow. The brain is the center of integration. Like a computer, the CPU is the center, right? The processing unit, central processing unit. So brain is our CPU. <clears throat> In the fish also, the same. If you see this diagram, nervous system, they are divided into peripheral, central, autonomic, and what are the peripheral? There are cranial nerves here, the spinal located in the forebrain, and then the central nervous system, there is brain, the spinal cord, this one is in the midbrain. <clears throat> and then autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Don't worry too much about this. You can always look into your a textbook or you can google later on you you'll find the answer so just to get the idea what is nervous system all about this is just revision yeah okay osmoregulation someone asked me about osmoregulation just now now we are in this topic freshwater telios are hyper osmotic to the surrounding solution so they face osmotic gain of water and diffusional loss of sodium chloride across the permeable gill epithelium. Marine telios are hypoosmotic to sea water. So they face osmotic loss of water and diffusional gain of sodium chloride across the gill. As a consequence of this osmotic and ionic gradient, marine telios excrete a small volume of urine that is approximately isosmotic to the plasma, while freshwater telios produce large volume of dilute urine. So you asked me just now, another organ you can include in the this gill, gill, the skin, the kidney, okay? Thermoregulation. From the word, you know the thermo, right? Thermo means temperature. Thermo is the process by which an organism controls its internal temperature. Fish have many different mechanisms for regulating their temperature. Most fish are ectothermic, using their environmental temperature to manage their body temperature, but some fish are endothermic, meaning having the metabolic ability to internally manage temperature. I think this is familiar to you, poikilothermic. We have learned this since our, uh, apa ya, in Indonesia, SMR. Poikilothermic fish are ectotherms. Uh, which have no control over their body temperature, meaning they depends on the outer temperature, the water temperature change, the body temperature change. That is the poikilothermic using the ambient temperature. Yeah, they don't have control. Eurothermic fish have evolved to survive in a wide range of environmental temperatures, and stenothermic fish have evolved to survive in a narrow range of environmental temperature. So the term that here is uri and steno. Steno means very limited. Uri is wide. Same thing goes uri haline. You know, uri haline means they will able to tolerate wide range of salinity. Steno haline, they have limited ability to tolerate wide range of salinity. So it's just a matter of terms only. Okay. Thermoregulation is very important for fish because temperature influences the function of many organs 
and the rate of many metabolic processes. Most fish species have evolved to survive within a specific temperature ranges. Outside that range, enzyme can degrade, organs can fail, and the organism can die. Understanding a thermoregulation for fish species is particularly important when considering implication for climate change. Why I share this uh, thermoregulation topic with you? Because the world now is uh, facing climate change. Climate change is real. It's a very, very critical phenomena that everyone on earth must uh, um, understand, must aware about the climate change. Uh, you know what happens, right, with the climate change, even though temperature did not increase uh, uh, in numbers that high, but increase in 0 0.5 or even 1 degree Celsius is a very huge impact to the environment, to our fish. The water or the ocean temperature increased by 0 0.5 or even 1 degree will be very, very detrimental to the fish. Yeah, same thing with the ocean acidification also. So this is very important. Okay, I want to share with you uh, about buoyancy. You know buoyancy, fish? The, the bladder, you remember the, the organs that we learned earlier on, fish are able to regulate their buoyancy by secreting gas into the swim bladder. Did you ever wonder why fish can float? Okay, I will show you this experiment. Um, what happened is the, the fish is able to secrete gas into the swim bladder as they descend through the water column and resorbing gas from the swim bladder when they ascend. Okay, so I will uh, go to this one. My job is to make college easier because students have a lot. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry, it's a bit slow. I just want to show you how fish use their swim bladder to maintain neutral buoyancy or uh, to, to, to float inside the water. Why? Hi everyone, my name is Ryan, I'm a presenter at SciTech. However, like most people, I'm not currently at work, so here I am in my dining room. Welcome! Now, at home, have you ever had a pet fish? Or perhaps you've seen a fish in the wild, in the ocean, river, lake, etc. Well, I'd like to help you learn a little bit more about them today. We're going to have a look and how fish maintain neutral buoyancy. That is, why they don't float to the surface and why they don't sink to the bottom. And to help us, we have a couple of experiments. But first, what is buoyancy? Buoyancy is an upward force that acts on objects in a fluid, like gas or liquids, such as water. That buoyancy depends on the densities of the objects to go into the fluid. <laughs> Objects that float have less density than the water it displaces. Objects that sink have a greater density than the water that it displaces. Some fish like to sink to the bottom. They live their everyday lives in it. But quite a lot of fish like to maintain a neutral buoyancy. 
cannabis, no flirting, no singing. Our next experiment is going to look at how sharks do just that, maintain neutral buoyancy. And yes, sharks are fish too. Now, like fish, sharks come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some sharks prefer to swim to the bottom of the ocean, whereas some sharks like to swim to the open water. Of those species, if they stop swimming, they will likely sink to the bottom of the ocean. That's because their bodies are so dense. However, this isn't the case. This is because sharks are equipped with oily substance called saline in their livers. So what we're doing for this experiment is a tank full of water. We have some blue tank here for weight. We have these two shark cats. And of course, two plastic containers filled with water and oil. These are going to act as our shark's livers. Okay, we're going to experiment with these now. What I'd like you to do is put some weight on the bottom of each of our shark livers. Like so. Make sure those leaves are untight, you don't want to make a mess. Make sure to start off with it's an even test, even weights on the bottom. Okay. We're going to put our shark cutouts underneath. Like so. Once 
you've done that, you can tighten the lid, make sure it's nice and tight so you don't want any water to come out. Now, I want you to pretend that our fish is going to go for a swim. It's going to go very deep into the water. What happens when fish swim deep into the water? As we get deeper, well, the pressure of the stony seawater increases. Well, we can mimic that effect in our experiment here. What I'm going to do is squeeze this bottle, and you can follow along at home, and we're going to watch what happens. Well, as we squeeze the bottle, we're increasing the pressure of the water, and this squeezes the air inside our pen as well. This happens in fish in real life as they move between depths. The pressure squeezes the gas inside their swim bladders. What this is actually doing is making the fish more dense than the surrounding water, and therefore it's natively buoyant. It sinks. How hard do you think you'll have to squeeze the bottle to keep the fish in the middle where it is actually oil? I want you to try it at home. Fortunately, fish have amazing ways that they can control the amount of air in their swim bladder. This allows them to stay nutritionally buoyant depending on the depth. Different species have involved different ways of doing this. Herring and eel, for example, go at the air to control that change. Most species, however, use a gas gland and it kind of works like an internal scuba tank that allows them to change their swim bladder's density. If your pen lid doesn't sink to the bottom when you squeeze the bottle, you might need to try a few different things. You might need to either add more blue tack to your pen lid, you might need to squeeze a little harder, or you might need to tighten the lid at the top. And there you have it. We've just explored the two most common ways that fish maintain neutral buoyancy. We looked at swaying in the shark and swim bladders in ray fin fish. Now, if you've enjoyed the experience we've done today, you can do a couple of things for me. The first thing is explore the world around you. With so many other fish species out there today that we know of, you never know what you can discover. And the second thing is we'd love to hear from you. Bye. Okay, so how was the video? Everyone understand the content? <clears throat> Is it okay? There are two experiments, right? One is on shark as a model, whereby because shark doesn't have swim bladder. Can, 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 can you all hear me? Yes, bro. Okay, good. Yes, bro. Okay, so the, in the case of shark without the swim bladder, what happened is they are using their liver, which is very huge liver filled with oil, very oily liver. That is what uh, uh, being used by the shark to float in the water, to neutrally buoyancy, maintain the, the, their buoyancy. So... Um, this uh you know the oil is less dense than water that is the very simple principle of shark whereby those with swim bladder they use the air trap in the uh, the swim bladder to float and then how when they ascend uh, going down to the uh, to the bottom the the pressure is high at the, as you go down and then the pressure will press and then the 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 gas inside the bladder will coming out and then fish will become more denser and uh, uh, going down able to go down to the bottom that is the two things about buoyancy in this uh, experiment okay let's have a look at sensory Specialized organs which receive physical and chemical stimuli from the environment call sense or sensory organ. There are many sensory organs. Just now someone asked me how fish see uh, um, in the dark. Of course, we have eye, but we also have other organs, especially this uh, um, listed organ that can help fish to sense, you know. 
sense danger, sense the, the, the balance, uh, where to go, things like that. So these are the sensory organ of a typical fish. Eye, internal ear, chemosensory organs, gustatory, which is the taste bud, olfactory, lateral line system, electroreceptor organs, ampullary organs, um, tuberous organs. So there are many sensory organs that, can, uh, that fish can use. Fishes possess a number of sense organs for smell, sight. See, sight. How they see, not depends on eye alone. Hearing, taste, touch, temperature, etc. The sense organs are associated with the nervous system and transmit the environmental stimuli to the central nervous system. Okay, let's have a look at the uh, uh, another important process, physiology process, which is the reproductive. Reproduction is very important for us in aquaculture because we want the fish to spawn and uh, multiply to as many numbers as possible because this, when we are talking about aquaculture, we want the volume, the numbers that we produce, of course, healthy and and good quality uh, fish. Okay, reproductive physiology of in fish is a set of physiological processes essential for reproduction, beginning with egg fertilization and ending with sexual behavior and spawning. Processes include gonad differentiation, puberty, male and female gameto gametogenesis, and the timing of reproductive cycles, all regulated by numerous neuroendocrine, endocrine, paracrine, autocrine, and all along the brain pituitary gonadal axis. These processes also interact with other important physiological functions, such as growth, nutrition, or small regulation and response to stress factor. RPF or reproductive physiology is also highly dependent on external factors such as temperature, photoperiod, photosalinity, which may modify the various stages of the reproductive process depending on the species, meaning to say, not only the ability of the fish in terms of their body, the readiness of the fish, but also external factor. When we want to do spawning, natural spawning or induced spawning using hormone, there are factors then that we need to consider, especially in the natural spawning in your um, hatchery, for example, in your pond. For example, you need to consider the temperature, the photoperiod, the water salinity, or even the lunar phase. Some species like grouper, we, they, they like to spawn during lunar. Uh, we have the hatchery with the transparent roofing, so that night time, the, 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 the influence of lunar, the moon, might be able to help this natural spawning or even the uh, induced spawning. In fact, fish exhibit a huge variety of specific reproductive strategies and tactics with just as many specific adaptations in terms of physiological regulation. So reproductive physiology is also a huge topic like endocrinology. It is um, 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 influenced by different species. Yeah, They have different adaptation for uh, um, uh, as, a, as reproductive strategies or tactics. Okay, another uh, interesting video. See, I, I, I'm sure you know that seahorse is also a kind of fish. It's a telios fish, but it's a very unique fish, unlike the other telios when it comes to their reproductive performance.
<clears throat> seahorse reproduction. The typical wild seahorse mating season begins in April and lasts until the seahorses move into deep water at the start of winter. The heart of their breeding season occurs during the warm summer months. However, seahorses within the southern region tend to breed all year round, especially when they're bred within captivity. To start off the breeding process, seahorses would pair off with the opposite sex, though a study in 2004 suggests there have been occasional occurrences of pairs of the same sex. Once paired, the seahorses will begin the courtship dance, which lasts several days. During the courtship dance, the pair will begin to synchronize with each other while twirling around one another with interlocked tails or gripping the same seaweed. The male seahorse will also begin expanding his brood pouch signaling that he is ready for the eggs to be deposited. Nearing the end of the courtship dance, the female seahorse will have a six-second window where the male seahorse's brood pouch is open. She will then extend a tube from her belly, attach herself to the male seahorse, and begin depositing the eggs. During this six-second window, seawater will also enter the pouch where both the spermatozoa and eggs meet. This environment will facilitate the sperm's activation and motility, in which they will eventually fertilize the eggs. Once the six-second window ends and the eggs become fertilized, the male seahorse will begin the gestation process. The eggs inside the male seahorse will then embed themselves to the pouch wall and become surrounded by spongy tissue. The gestation process can last upwards of 45 days, where the male seahorse's brood pouch will act as an incubation pod, supplying the eggs with both oxygen and prolactin, the same hormone responsible for milk production in pregnant mammals. Though the embryos within the pouch receive nourishment from the egg yolk, the male seahorses contribute additional nutrients such as energy-rich lipids and calcium, which are secreted into the brood pouch. The brood pouch is quite an amazing structure as it also offers immunological protection, asthma regulation, gas exchange, and waste transport. While this is happening, the female seahorse has completed her part of the reproductive process and goes off on her merry way. However, she will come back to visit the male seahorse on a daily basis to say hello. After the gestation process, the male seahorse prepares to expel the small fries from its pouch through muscular contractions. For most seahorse species, the male seahorse expels an average of 100 to 1,000 fries, but can reach as high as 2,500. Once expelled, the small fries are on their own as seahorses do not nurture their young after birth. They spend the first two to three weeks of their lives drifting along in the plankton layer of the ocean. Unfortunately, less than 0.5% of infants survive to adulthood as they are susceptible to natural predators, extreme temperatures that can be too much for their delicate bodies, or ocean currents that can sweep them away from their feeding ground. As these small fries are left to their own devices, the adult male and female seahorses restart the reproductive process, sometimes with different partners. If you enjoyed the content, please consider supporting us by liking the video and subscribing to our channel. Okay. <clears throat> so interesting about seahorse. I thought yeah. <laughs> Very I, interesting. <laughs> I think everyone knows that the male got pregnant, but remember the egg is still from the female. The female transfer the egg to the a male brood pouch and then it will be incubated in the in the male pouch until it uh, hatch out and become miniature seahorse they don't have larva stage seahorse uh, um, hatch out as small seahorse they don't have different stage like in fish they have larvae and then you know become metamorphosis to juvenile no they have exactly the same as adult but in a, a smaller size um i did my master degree in seahorse uh, um, diet in australia back in 
1999 to 2000. Uh, it's a very interesting creature. They are known to be monogamous, meaning to say they stick to one partner in the wild. I think I'm not sure if there is current research showing that they will not stick to one partner if they are cultured in the hatchery or in the tank. I'm not sure. We haven't got the answer yet. Mm. But uh, maybe I missed out uh, the latest journal. But as far as I know, they are homogenous. Uh, oh, sorry, monogenous, meaning uh, uh, they are very loyal. Yeah, setia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and and you you you, I think you are aware also that seahorse is also another uh, aquaculture species which is yeah. uh, receiving much attention for traditional Chinese medicine and of course for aquarium. Uh, um, uh, species which is yeah. uh, quite expensive yeah. so very interesting okay. oh okay that's the end of the slide <laughs> <laughs> I, I have more well we still want to hear more <laughs> This is just an uh, introduction because I believe whether you are S1 or S2, you have covered some biology um, class, right? In, in your, in your uh, um, class. So this is just like a revision so that easy for us to um, follow the next uh, lectures once yeah. we remember the basic. Okay, thank you yes, so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so very much, Prof. Rosita, which is very interesting uh, lecture, actually. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, it's not only uh, interesting for the students of aquaculture, but for us from the uh, uh, MSP pro uh, study program, also very interesting in your lecture as well. So um, we still have plenty of time. So um, please, whether uh, now the students wants to um, ask questions because we are entering the uh, question and answer quite early uh, since um, the lecture is already finished for this uh, introduction. So is there any? Um, participant or students wants to uh, ask questions? Um, is there? Isn't there? Oh, we still haven't got any questions even in a chat. Um, probably uh, I will uh, start uh, question myself, Professor, uh, for the last video that you have showed us uh, today. Um, even though the, uh, what is that, the X or is from the female, mm -hmm. but the, the development of the X is in the a, in a male seahorse, yeah. which is already provided as if uh, in, in, in women, <laughs> you yeah. know, like in the, uh, here in the stomach, you know, in the womb. Yeah, it seems like 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 female womb because it's uh, provided food, provided everything that the the egg should uh, grow or uh, have to grow. So, uh, in this case, uh, does it mean that the sea the male seahorse is also uh, what considered as um, part women or something like that because? <laughs> a part a female because it has all the requirement uh, for the egg to develop, isn't it? Yeah, um, actually, they are, uh, uh, I don't think um, they are partly women, they are, they are still male. Uh, they, no, they are not uh, about having a characteristic of female apart from what we call they have parental care. 
Mm. Well, yeah, a species with parental care, they will, uh, what do you call, brood the, 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 the youngs. Uh, like um, uh, in the pouch, yeah, like kangaroo pouch, this is also the pouch in, in the seahorse, whereby they can carry the babies as many as, like the video said, up to mm -hmm. like thousand mm -hmm. uh, in one time and then pregnancy lasts like depend on species like 10 days to a month depends on on, on what species so um the, the the role of male and female here is only changing in terms of uh, after the release of egg uh, by the female then male will look after it there is no such thing as male has some uh, chromosome like you know the, the x y <laughs> no it, it, it like the female the seahorse yeah, yeah it is <laughs> oh, okay yeah. yeah it was uh really interesting to see that uh, the pouch provide all the uh, requirement for the yeah. eggs to to, to grow. grow become yeah. a baby or something yeah <laughs> which is in, uh, of course in 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 mammals or uh, in human uh it belongs to to female i mean yeah something like that but yeah, it is very yeah. very interesting uh, you know uh very interesting to to, to see these uh, videos yeah very unique animal actually yeah very unique animal mm -hmm. really <laughs> absolutely true okay um are they uh okay uh, i saw already i see already a question from uh fariana Fariana, would you like to deliver your question directly to Prof. Rosita or you want me, uh, you, you prefer me to read your questions? Uh, Fariana, you can deliver yourself. Do you want? Oh, I think maybe she's shy. All right, <laughs> then I will read it for you, Prof. Rosita. Okay. Yeah. Which organ or sensory organ in fish or shrimp that most affected by the temperatures change on the water? Usually fish shrimp have decreased appetite when the temperature is uh, dropped. Okay. What did, yeah. okay, I don't have any um, exact knowledge or readings on on uh, exactly what what organ but as you can see in the previous slide fish has several sensory organs right so definitely all these organs will be able to um, detect the uh, what do you call the changes in this uh, temperature whether it's the the uh, what do you call a, a, a different um, uh, sensory organ but most logic would be the lateral line system because it is across the body from the caudal peduncle up to the area of the head. That is how the lateral line system works. So when we talk about temperature, of course, yeah. when fish swim, these are the most exposed area to the, to the water or the temperature. So I, I think... Uh, this organ will will first uh, uh, um, detect these changes. Yeah, usually fish shrimp have decreased appetite when the temperature is going drop. Yeah, that that is true because not only temperature, I would say even salinity. You know, when it's too heavy rain or or, or water is polluted, definitely the 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 appetite will be will be disturbed i hope i answer your question by by logic the lateral line system you know will be uh, most affected lah, first as the sensory organ okay oh okay hopefully this will answer your questions fariana oh, okay is there any other questions uh, yeah I think among participants, we um, I also see some of the uh, uh, lecturer here, Professor Rosita. I see. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, the Master of Aquaculture is coursework program, or do they are they doing by research? 
in the magister i think that, uh, they both we still have uh, both uh, system in in our uh, department i mean in our faculty in one program how about these three in one program are they uh, doing coursework or by research um, they have to do thesis or, or project no thesis thesis Usually okay. in magister is thesis here. Yeah. They have to do some coursework as well and also some research as well. So this three in one program. Um, oh, no! Yeah. This this three in one program in our uh, faculty usually uh, will be include several activities such as uh, in uh, you know like uh, inviting the guests. Uh, speaker from other uh, university uh, around the world i mean from abroad and uh, other will be uh, some uh, i guess uh, uh, not only just guest lecturer prof uh, Lamy. Uh, i think the three in one program is not only just guest lecture i suppose there must be some other uh, uh, activities yes uh, like a practice See, so the the student, the master of aquaculture, is doing research. Is it? Is it among the activities that they can do some research as well in this oh. three in one program? Oh, I mean, I mean, the student that register as master in aquaculture, do they have to take subjects like that and then do project or purely research? Both. Uh, take the oh. course and do the research. I see. And, it's and a yeah. mixed mode. In yeah, yes. it's, in the it's mix. a mixed yes. mode. So how many credit hours they have to take? And then when, when which semester they have to do uh, research? Uh, they will take the research start in third semester. I see. So, so the, the first, first the second is the lecture. Ah, yeah. it's a mixed it's a mode. coursework. Uh, professor. So how many yes. years for master? Two years. Two, two years, years, yes. Mostly two yes. years, yes. Yeah. I still remember when I was in University of Tasmania, I also take this mixed mode. One year uh, attending classes mm -hmm. and then after that only we do our uh, thesis dissertation, they call it. So you ah, have the same yeah. thing, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, in the future, um, among this uh, three-in-one program, they will be like sending uh, some students to do some research. Hopefully, <laughs> because it's still like to be uh, has to be proposed. I think this uh, kind of activities from Rosita for mm -hmm. students, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there is another question in the in chat, Professor. Okay, uh, yeah. Can I read? It? Yeah, can yeah. I read it for you? Please, please. Yeah, okay. It's from Elizabeth Tirani. Uh, I have questions to Prof. Rosita. Kangaroos have pouches and milk from female kangaroos for the growth and development of the young. What are the advantages of male seahorse that a female seahorse does not have? So <laughs> the male seahorse would take care of their young. <laughs> okay, uh, it's a very unique creation of God. I always believe that. I, I, I actually I don't have the answer why God created them like that, but uh, obviously God created seahorse, the male one with pouch and the female one without pouch. So um, it is that the pouch is dedicated to 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 house the the egg and nurture. I think God is being fair here so that the male also experience how to you know being pregnant <laughs> i'm sorry for my not uh, not so scientific explanation as i don't really have the answer for for this yeah i but i do believe uh, uh, that is the way uh, uh, how nature works yeah <laughs> maybe they want to to talk to us or <laughs> yeah. to give a lesson to us, to you, um, a human that you should balance <laughs> yeah. in responsibility for yeah. raising the children, the young. Yeah. 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 I guess it's, um, how about the, probably professor, you know, just extended these questions. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Rista, I think uh, Nemo, a fish, uh, there was a clown fish. Mm -hmm. It's also like um, uh, the the male who who take care of the the eggs, isn't it? I'm In not, their mouth. I'm not sure uh, whether or not clownfish uh, uh, is the uh, showing parental care. Uh, I know that um, Taiwan University they have this um, uh, clownfish breeding program. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. we, we in our institute never uh, um, have a very successful. We've tried before, but hatching of Nemo is so long. It takes very long so that, um, yeah, yeah it, it doesn't like normal fish, but uh, clownfish, I think days, you know, it takes days to hatch. So I'm, I'm not sure which one is looking after the 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 eggs or the youngs, whether the male or the female. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I don't I don't can't answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just only in the theory that they they yeah. did that. So yeah. we just learned, but we probably uh, has um, not yet. Uh, uh, what is that? Recovered or discovered? Why is uh, something like that? Yeah. Uh, hopefully, in the future, it will be somebody. Yeah, so this, this, this is another um, maybe topic for uh, uh, research for the student. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can, yeah. yeah. If, if they you know, haven't got a title or a topic for their uh, thesis, their research, maybe mm. based on this, they can think, you know, like uh, uh, last time we want to prove whether. Uh, seahorse is still loyal in captivity or not so this thing require um, behavior study like i was supposed i was supposed to do this behavior study but mm, i yeah. found it so boring because i have to sit down in front of a huge tank with different different <laughs> uh, types of seahorse male female I have to observe them whether they will only stick to one partner throughout the day. So I was like, that is so <laughs> difficult because they look like the same, but I have to familiarize which A, which one is B or something like that. So <laughs> okay. Maybe the wow. student can start a project like that also to prove whether this seahorse is still loyal in captivity, like in the wild that, you know, they are uh, forever... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. again another lesson for us human we should faithful <laughs> because the, yeah. the animal seems like uh faithful also yeah. <laughs> um Prof <laughs> professor Rosita, what you mentioned just now it's just the same what i have in mind because mm -hmm. the some uh some and many <laughs> oh, sorry. Many of the students also from the postgraduate departments. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can uh, give an idea or mention or uh, with, from your experience, what kind of research that they probably interested in or something like that, or they can uh, pursue with, uh, of course, with, uh, with probably the facility in your uh, research center or something like that they will be interested probably more yeah, but in yeah. general yeah yeah thank you uh, Umi. actually my field is on nutrition and aquaculture feed development so my research is normally um, centered or focused on nutrition uh, like i determine requirement protein lipid like uh, fatty acids sometimes vitamins i do the requirement study with my students and then another topic of my interest is looking for cheap but good working working ingredient cost effective ingredient uh, to for for aquaculture uh, feeds that that is mm, my focus mm. so in my lab i normally a screen or, or um, investigate different ingredients like uh, because you know for developing feed we use fish meal yeah. and then yeah. for the lipid sauce we use fish oil so in my lab I always look for alternative to this too like uh, whether poultry byproduct or now I'm working on insect meal 
uh, soybean meal, um, what else? Fish byproducts, different types of um, of uh, protein sauce. You know, I work yeah. on some carbohydrates and then um, palm oil. I have several uh, students working on palm oil and then. I also work on uh, seaweed, a little bit on seaweed culture, and then, of course, um, um, some uh, applied phycology, like using algae in my formulation. Um, what else? Yeah, um, yeah. I do some seahorse conservation study, but um, not very often because. Um, these days, I'm quite busy to go out to the field and you know do sampling and all that. So I prefer to do um, lab-based work. Okay. Students and um, but the pandemic really hits our project. I have two active research grant now, but not moving much because of uh, the, the pandemic because we closed the lab and all that. So most of our samples are not no longer can be used. Do you experience this also in Prawijaya, uh, Bumi? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the, the campus is really quiet for two years already now, <laughs> because no students and laboratory are closed. Uh, so every almost every facilities are still closed. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it is the same situations, I think, everywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Challenging, right? Yeah, it's very challenging. And yeah, of course, probably uh, just postgraduate uh, students or uh, PhD students who really on the research um, uh, period, they uh, seems like to yeah have a very strict granted to enter the uh, laboratory, I suppose, because yeah, of the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, I think it's the same, just the same, Professor. What is the same? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, there was another one, questions, Professor. Uh, okay, this is from Genesia. Wow, uh, Genesia Kerin Lucia. <laughs> oh, I don't know whether this is a undergraduate or postgraduate. Her questions, Professor, can we as human teach aquatic organism to do some things like another animal such cat and dogs. Oh, as we know, if we go to the zoo, sometimes there's performance that show how the trainer plays with the dolphin. Do the dolphins or another aquatic organism or fish can memorize things that we can teach them to do or just something like instinct? And can we stimulate or increase their senses sensitivity of the fish sensory system. Thank you, Prof. Rosita. <laughs> okay, uh, I try to answer, yeah, you may not, uh, I mean, uh, I may not be able to answer it uh, uh, very, very specific because I don't really have a direct uh, experience with dolphins, but what I know is dolphins brain is the second most powerful and complex brain in animals next to the human brains meaning they have some sort of intelligence to i think i believe they can memorize because the, this uh, uh, they have this uh, intelligence so uh, i believe they not just uh, what do you call it's not just instinct like what you ask um if I don't, I'm not mistaken, our EQ, human EQ is about seven maybe, and dolphin is about half, like four, like that. So dolphin is one of the smartest animal that I know. I'm sure when they have this intelligence system, they can uh, memorize things that, you know, they, they are playing ball, you know, they, they are responding to instructions. So... I, I believe that, uh, um, of course, we, we can stimulate or increase the sensitivity of the system. And I'm not sure if you watch this, uh, My Octopus Teacher in Netflix. Anyone watch that? I watched that four times and I cried. I don't know why. <laughs> it's a documentary 
I thought when I look at the Netflix, I thought it's a movie. It's the title is My Octopus Teacher. My Octopus, octopus. Sotong. What do yeah, you yeah, call, yeah. What do you call cumi cumi? What uh, what octopus? octopus? Octopus is gurita. Ah, gurita. Yeah. Yeah, the title yeah. of this this is not a movie per se, but it's a movie to me. Uh, my my uh, octopus teacher um, won several award. I didn't know about this movie actually. I just when I uh, glance through my Netflix, I see yeah. oh, it, it's quite interesting. So I just one boring day, I just watch this, and it turned out that it's so um, it's a twenty twenty Netflix original a uh, documentary. Yeah, uh, it's so. What do you call it? Uh, very interesting because you know our background about you know aquatic species and all that. But I came to know from this uh, uh, documentary actually octopus is another smart animal, aquatic animal. Very very smart. When you watch it, as if they can think like human. You know. This octopus mm. and this diver, they develop relationship because the diver go every day to this uh, diving spot. And then during the first meeting, they are not very, you know, they are not, uh, the, the octopus is quite shy, quite uh, uh, keeping a distance, but slowly, slowly they develop this relationship. And um, yeah, there are many, many things out, out of this story that, you know, that very interesting. If you have chance, I think I encourage everyone of this aquaculture <laughs> program, you watch, you, you watch this octopus. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say, not only yeah. dolphins, but other creatures, aquatic animals also, uh, they have this amazing uh, brain uh, capacity. Yeah, yeah. like... Um... A shark probably, or even the uh, the, the whales. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, there are a lot of movies say. Um, I mean, saying how smart they are, still remember things or yeah, something they, like that, isn't it? It's a movie Rosita. last time, Blue Willy or something Willy or something. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's also I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Animal lover, Professor yeah, Rosita. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there was another uh, question again from chat. Uh, this is from students, uh, Andin Rianisti. Yeah. Uh, how the how many how many factors that correspond to the reproduction process will be managed or organized by the fish? How many factor? that correspond to the reproductive process will be managed by or recognized by a fish. Which factors are the most important for the fish to decide whether they will mating or not? <laughs> or, they, uh, or maybe they will release their egg or not? <laughs> Do you think they, they can think that, <laughs> Professor? Very difficult <laughs> question, Andy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have covered some of the information in the slide earlier. If you remember, like, you know, environmental factors like temperature, the water condition, the light, or even the, um, what do you call the... The, the, the pH, probably. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah salinity. Like, yeah, mm, uh, Luna, yes. something like that, the moon, you know, these yeah. are natural, yes, uh, that's right. natural factors or even raining, you know, things like that uh, may have some influence to, to fish. Um, <clears throat> but um, what do you call, uh, which factor the most important of fish to decide where, where either they will mating or not? is not determined one by one single factor, I believe. You remember the process of gonad development? When they are ready, you know, development of gonad will go through several stages until they are totally matured. If you go through your seed production or, or artificial breeding in this yeah, morning, right. yeah, yes, yes. yeah, you will, uh, some, uh, whether we do uh, artificial or, or natural, we have to to check the readiness of the gonad, things like that, you know, when in the concept of aquaculture, we cannot wait too long because we want to produce a lot of fish. That's why we 
force them with the injection of hormone so that the gonads that are not ready become ready. So there are many factors, yeah, like physiological factors, like you know the readiness, the maturity actually is most important whether they want to release egg or not, not only the environmental factor, internal and external, I would say becoming the most uh, uh, important factor. I hope I answer your question. Andy. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, I also remember that uh, some uh, like, uh, what is that? Um, uh, what is kerang? Kerang is... Uh, Bival. Bivalva. Yeah, bivalva, yeah. I think they, uh, even some gastropod, they really related to the tide, you know, uh, Professor uh-huh. Rashida. Yeah, yeah. I don't have... know much about Viva. I don't do research on Viva. I think very interesting. <laughs> yeah. You can share with us, Bumi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I I add uh, some uh, information that some other organism, aquatic organism, also really related to the tide. You know, okay. that they really spawning yeah, when yeah, the tide yeah. comes and so on, Professor. Thank you so very much for your answer. I think it's uh, clear enough, yeah, Andin. Hopefully that answer your questions. Um, and uh, uh, still um, continuing with your uh, information regarding your uh, expertise, uh, Professor Rosita. Okay. That uh, it was some like uh, uh, you know like food sources, which is very in- important to if we want to formulate the feed. Uh, or the food yeah. of feed of fish feed or something like that mm-hmm. and of course is that really uh, related with the the of course what we are uh, topic uh, of this three in one program i mean the immune system of the organism so when we try to find some source of uh, feed is it uh, should we relate it them with the immune system or something like that probably do you have an um. idea um or just the, because of the protein content probably i think the best because now we are moving towards sustainable aquaculture production whereby mm-hmm. when we talk about sustainability we also talk about food uh safety things like that we don't want to do any uh, to use any chemicals especially antibiotics so it's good that if we can include in the formula something that is natural that can boost immunity like herbs or anything like that which will be covered in the i think the on on friday we are talking about medicinal plants and animals that uh, a topic given to me i i will try my best to cover that uh, issue uh, in terms of of functional food or functional aquaculture feed that is not using um what do you call uh, antibiotics or chemicals uh, uh, in, in the formulation? Yeah. I want to oh. share a video of yeah. my feed product that I produced that was selected by the Ministry of uh, Education Malaysia. This one back in 2017. Um, it is a called Blockbuster product. Let's see, uh, it is in the YouTube, it's already uploaded. Aquaculture is one of the fastest expanding agricultural industries in the world. The rapid growth of aquaculture industry requires new perspectives, especially in the use of cost-effective and eco-friendly feed formulation. Usually, the high-quality feed will be imported with high price. <laughs> Kalau tu ikan bata yang sudah buruk, 
kadang-kadang kami beri dia makan juga kemudian dapat sakit macam luka-luka dalam di badannya macam lambat lah yang kalau tu dia cepat besar kemana kan kita dapat kita katakan masa kami bagi makan berikan baca pagi petang pagi petang berpicu kami memerlukan baca yang berkualiti tinggi dan harga yang berbeza. Kerubis and marine fish feed. Formulated based on special blend of ingredients to cut cost and lessen the pressure on wild fish stock. The ingredients used in the formulation is of high quality and can be obtained in large quantity in the global market. Fish fed the Garupa feed showed significantly higher growth rate, excellent survival and better conversion ratio. The Garupa feed is 30% cheaper than the commercial imported feed. The project was led by Professor Dr. Asit Ashapawi. The product was awarded several achievement, including international awards. Recently, the Garupa formulation had been sold to a Dabi food consumer for commercial production. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> itu uh, uh, apa produknya yang saya develop uh, hasil dari I think PhD mungkin yeah what an achievement of course it will be very uh, interesting I was just uh, yeah heard from yesterday I think I met somebody who uh, actually is not an expert at all in uh, I mean uh, she's not um, uh, a degree uh Hold students uh, she was just like an uh apa, um a mother but uh she she is selling fish uh in our uh neighborhood and she can uh like uh, saying that um, what made the uh, uh, successful uh, like breed or breeding or aquaculture is because of the food mm -hmm. if you if you give a, a high quality food then uh, the fish will be happy <laughs> and healthy <laughs> something like that even though uh, she's not uh, really uh, an expert a uh, uh, student or post uh, university student something like that so she must have understand oh sorry i think in my place uh, there are azan already um uh, maybe i will stop just two two minutes uh, uh to just let the azan pass is it okay professor rosita yes, yes, yes.
Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so very much because it's very loud, the, the masjid here, the Azan. So it will be just, uh, uh, you know, like I can't he even hear my voice. Thank you, Prof. Rosita. I think uh, because still there's still no questions or probably uh, one of the participants in this class uh, want to, to have a direct conversation with Prof. Rosita. Ah, <laughs> again. Uh, because uh, there's still no questions. Um, okay, I will uh, give uh, another chance for Gomez to deliver your questions. Go, uh, yeah. Okay, you can ask. I think you are still mute. Please unmute yourself. This is trouble. My my internet maybe. Okay. Uh, somebody here clear my voice. Yes. Yes. Gomez, very clear. Okay. Thank you for the second opportunity. When I saw the. Uh, the film about the grouper cultivation. I'm very interested because uh, I also have a bad experience in the grouper cultivation in my country, in Timor-Leste. Uh, so I want to share uh, my experience to you, uh, Prof. Rosita, and also Madam Umi and Mr. Dailami, and also the audience maybe uh, have a good, good idea and good opinion to to enhance my knowledge to continue my business when I'm finishing my study in Brahmijaya University. So I have a bad uh, experience when I finished my uh, bachelor degree in. Muhammadiyah Malang University in ah. 2010. At the that 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 year when I'm finished, I'm back to the Timor Leste and I'm, and the first uh, person to establish catch uh, floating net in Timor Leste. I'm cultivating the sea bass and also uh, uh, tiger grouper or Chromileptus altifelis, I uh, know, uh, Epinepelus fusco gutatos. Yeah, Karapu, uh, yeah. Karapu, yeah. Karapu. Yeah, okay. uh, As you know, in Timor-Leste, we, if we establish the aquaculture, especially in marine culture, not yet in Timor-Leste. We just uh, introduced uh, fresh water on way, cultivation, because uh, we have support from the New Zealand government and we, our government ordered the larvae uh, mono, monoxic tilapia from the Penang, Malaysia. Uh, so now we uh, uh, distribute to all the stakeholders in Timor Leste, but the marine culture, not yet. I already uh, tried to, to do that with myself as a technician and also as a labo to do something with my myself but uh, not success so i'm still lack of information lack of the uh, knowledge about the grouper uh, cultivation so uh, i ordered seed from the gondol bali uh, in the beginning when we are ready in the uh, floating net in first uh, first week until two two week the condition is okay but three week the we see the no move and the the condition of the larvae is a decrease of the 
Fatty, eh? Nafsu, uh, nafsu makan, eh? Uh, is uh, decrease. And then that only two out of three days, all of the most the 80% is died. I tried this day three times. I'm trying to three times order the seed from the Bali, but uh, all of the seed is not success. But uh, before we send the seed from Bali to the Timor Leste, they, they also uh, have a certificate from the uh, aquatic animal health and also from quarantine uh, documents. This is uh, complete, but uh, when I'm cultivating, rearing in the uh, cage floating net, not success. I think uh, if you talk about the water quality in Timor-Leste, it's still okay because we don't have uh, uh, manufacturing. So the water quality, I'm not, I'm not worried, but maybe uh, this is about uh, bacterial attack or virus attack, maybe. So, so that I want to hear uh, information and knowledge from the audience, especially from uh, Prof. Rosita, uh, to increase my knowledge about that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Gomez. Okay, please, Ros Rosita. Thank you, Gomez, for sharing your experience. I'm glad to know that someone with, um, you know, undergo a degree in agriculture also involved uh, hands-on practically in this industry. So I wish that the aquaculture industry in our region, especially, will be led by someone like you who has knowledge I mean, um, we're not saying that those people are involving in the industry now, they don't have knowledge, but uh, most uh, uh, um, aquaculture industry in uh, our region, you know, the, the ASEAN still run by people without the aquaculture skills. But this one, like you, you are now is, um, are you a postgraduate or undergraduate student? S1 or S2? I'm a postgraduate, uh, good. madam. Yeah. Good, good. So meaning the industry, especially later on when you go back to Timor-Leste, may be led by someone who is educated in aquaculture. So this is a very good sign for the industry that someone like that will lead the, the industry. Um, because when we talk about aquaculture, uh, uh, you must know not only you want to get, gain profit, but you also be a responsible aquaculture risk or aquaculture producer or practice uh, uh, in, in your place later on because aquaculture is these days is always blamed for pollution, you know, things that are very negatively uh, portrayed by other industry. So I'm glad that, that you are involved in this line. So to, to answer your question, there is a, a very you no know, direct uh, answer for me because when you said the the death of your fish is like 30% per, per, uh, per, per day or is, is it the whole batch die or only uh, little by little? Because when you said uh, the whole population die at one time, normally mass mortality is due to the water quality but then you said water quality doesn't seem to be the problem in your in your place because it's still very pristine still very clean so um there are other factors that might be uh, uh the, the factors to to your issue because i'm not sure where do you get your seed um because seed when you get it from somewhere else uh, during transportation and all this, it will put stress, a lot of stress to your fish. I last time bought my fish as far as Bali to Kota Kinabalu. So <laughs> when I got the fish, uh, after one week, I everything gone, totally gone. Yeah, there are several Ooh. things. I, I can't say, I, I cannot point one factor. Of course, maybe in my case, it's due to the stress, very long hours of transportation, or in the industry when they sell. I'm, I, I was working is with Chromin Leptis Altivellis also myself. For my PhD, I did diet development on Kerapu Bebek. 
uh, <coughs> ultimate uh, altivalis. This chromileptis altivalis is not like the epinephalus. They are so fussy. They don't. They need good water, clear water, unlike the the epinephalus. So I have issue also apart from uh, slow growth. Chromileptis is growing very, very slow. And there are also, um, do you want to stop for a while? Oh, okay. Oh, no, it's, it's okay. It's just, okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, apart from so, uh, growing very slow, Chromileptis also, when, when I came to know from the supplier, when we got this seed, they said they have different grade. Some said they said this is the head, this is the tail, meaning to say they have a lower grade, higher grade, middle grade. If you get the lower grade, chances of them surviving is very low. So in other words, genetic also playing an important role to determine your fish performance. Yeah, uh, When your fish is stressed, easily for them to be attacked by disease or uh, whatever disease or very sensitive to water quality changes in the water quality also become very little to them so i'm not sh i don't know for sure what is the cause of your issue in your farm but if you said uh, you've tried several times if you i'm not sure if the water is the right water whether it's a static water area or there's some movement is it the water too fast the current is very high I, i'm not sure about that but you need to consider all all that yeah you need to see whether the site that you choose is there any success before you on other species for example if if it's a new site that no one ever uh, started uh, any farm there you you might want to do some water quality tests or uh, definitely, like I said, the quality of your seed has to be uh, 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 checked properly so that you won't have the issue with high mortality. Um, because like us also, uh, my institute is near the sea, you know, just our backyard is the ocean. We do some seaweed culture. It turned out that it can grow, but the current is too strong. So every time it will fall down to the uh, to the bottom. So things like this need to be considered also. I think I think the suitability of your site, uh, apart from the quality of your seed, uh, feed will takes time to kill the fish. You know, it may cause slow growth, but if if it's not poisonous, <laughs> there is no toxic uh, material in it. It will not kill your fish. Uh, instantly normally it will take time to to have some impact on on your fish so that's my answer i hope i i, I give you some idea <laughs> yeah thank you for your answer professor Lesita. I, I guess uh, you are right uh, when all the organism in this uh, culture are died it must be not only just one or uh, factor probably there will be many factor and of course uh, it will it will need experience uh, to uh, see the the problem uh, one by one, isn't it? That um, the the answer. <laughs> so we just cannot answer uh, just from one factor, I suppose. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for the answer. Hopefully, this will uh, answer your questions, comments, and also still encourage you to. To be a good, uh, uh, what's it, aquaculturist <laughs> in business, and hopefully in the future there will be more success with the, uh, the 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 activity, your business. Um, okay. Um, is there any other questions? Probably want to be asked. We still got like uh, fifteen minutes. <clears throat> Um, no questions? <laughs> yeah, okay, um, yeah, I, I was just only probably uh, uh, telling you ab uh, about my experience a little bit when I was um, also uh, 
had my chance to give a lecture on colloquium, uh, Professor Rosita in the Magister or in postgraduate uh, study program. Uh, most of them are really interested in basically in immune system, in shrimp, especially. Yeah, of course, uh, fish. Yeah, some of them are really in uh, interested in shrimp. So it will be very interesting later on to to hear what is uh, what kind of immune system that fish and shrimp uh, different in. You know, like. Uh, some of the or aquatic organism has a specific uh, immune system and some of them are really forgetting something like that. Isn't it that right, Professor? They they forget or they cannot just keep the, the memory of the, um, the, yeah, the... Yeah, you're right. So I will be interested to, to hear more about that later on. Hopefully they will be involved in one of your lecture. Yeah. yeah, I'll touch on uh, tomorrow yeah. a little bit. Uh, my background is also not so much on <laughs> immune system, but I will share about uh, general things and some some uh, um, what do you call published paper on the supplement rules in immune system. Oh, okay. So, so this is really a very good chance for who the students who are really interested in uh, molecular immunology of course uh, they should have a uh, take uh, advantage of the, the, this togetherness with professor rosita so they can have more knowledge about that pt that they uh, so you i encourage all the students to ask questions of course no matter what the, the, the question is, I, I guess uh, uh, hopefully Ro, or Professor Rosita will have the answer. So is there any other questions? Yeah, or maybe the student would like to share their experience or their ah, okay. hope, what is their opinion, things like that. I think our culture in Asia, you know, we are not very vocal. I, when I was a student like you also, I don't like to ask question and I don't like to be asked also by the lecturer. And oh my God. Yeah, very quiet kind of, you know, student. But I think we should come out of our yeah comfort zone so that uh, you, you need to train yourself. This will be very useful for your um, career development, your future, especially after this, if you are interested to work, you will definitely uh, went through interviews and all that. So um, you just need to be confident. Yeah, if you're yeah. confident, even though your, for example, your English is broken, it doesn't matter. The confidence is, you know, count. I know someone. Um, he's a Japanese. His English, we can understand his English. Of course, uh, it's not perfect. I mean, uh, we are not English uh, native speakers. Yeah, so that's can, right. Right. But he is a very confident person. So when I compare the two different talk by this A and B, A is the one with, you know, so-so English, and this one is very good English. But the content in the way he, he explained, the way he delivered the ideas is very interesting with uh, some, uh, of course, uh, um, what do you call with the, the style and everything. Uh, uh, people love his uh, um, sharing in, in a conference because of the confidence. I think it, it's more important than, you know, having to worry you use uh, wrong grammar or things like that. So don't worry about that. People know that we are not born. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nothing. English don't color, worry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Another thing is I, I noticed that your ability to uh, Anya, uh, to write, to publish your paper, is there any requirement in Brawijaya University to publish paper so that we, the student can graduate? Is there anything like that? Yeah, yeah, of course, especially in my Christel. In oh. postgraduate students, yes. Yeah, yeah, because this is course, absolutely. <laughs> oh, it's compulsory, right, Bumi? Yes, it's, it's, it's compulsory. Yeah. Yes, it's in, compulsory. In our university, master student has to produce one journal article only, but it has to be in Scopus minimum, 
and then for PhD, oh. two, two, two article in Scopus. That is the requirement. Otherwise, you cannot graduate. So, wow. like I, I, I say, I don't think English is the, the hindrance or the, the major obstacle. Yeah, if you are right. determined, as long as you mm. are determined, you are working hard, English becoming like number two or number three, it's not a main thing anymore. Because when you are determined, you will do your very best, all you can to, to write, to publish your work. So again, uh, the, the moral of the story <laughs> here is I, I would like to encourage all the students to be able to express ideas to to respond to communicate you know to to discuss freely without having to fear that people will laugh at you or people will think uh, uh, negatively or people will uh, yeah your friend will you know make fun of you no no such thing i think it's about time to to change that uh, our um, attitude mindset yes, yes. mindset correct <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, yeah, that's right, Professor Sita. I think, uh, yeah, uh, I do uh, also uh, understand as well why, why uh, probably, I believe they, they like have a question in their mind probably, but they just too shy or whatever to, to mention it or Ah, uh, later probably will be answered later in the in the theory or in the in class or something like that. So I, I believe just everyone understand it because it's a very simple um, uh, sharing or topic. So <laughs> everyone already <laughs> understands. So not much of uh, difficulties to follow. So it's, it's a good thing that yeah, all students will be able to understand. It's yeah, amazing. hopefully, yeah. So not not very difficult. Our our expertise is more to our strength is more on biology, unlike other other uh, 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 field. You know, like engineering or you know, aquaculture is very biology based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Rosita. I I see a lot. Uh, some of uh, lecturer actually uh, my colleague here. So um, who knows, probably uh, they want to share experience or uh, uh, ha have uh, something in their mind. So I, I, I encourage them to, to raise their hands, to, to speak out or whatever. Yeah. So I, uh, please, I give the time for the lecturer probably. Uh, my colleague, my dear colleagues, if you have a question or probably comment or share uh, experience with Prof. Uh, Rosita or in this class. Or maybe we can think of how to collaborate in research, like among lecturers, like me in UMS and you in Brawijaya, how best we can um, uh, do yeah. a research project together, let's say comparing what species, what you have in my species, and then later we combine the results and publish them together. So I think that will be very, very good. Yeah, start, it's very, right? yes, very good and very promising. Yeah, I we think, think that okay, let's say we, we create two experiments. Uh, we start with simple yeah. one maybe, but one is conducted with in, in your place, one in my place. So we see what is the difference and then we combine the result and we, we produce a, a paper, for example, for a start. It doesn't have to be scopus for, for, for a start. We, we can try something like that with, with our student, like master or, you, you know, the mixed board. Have yeah, to yeah. Um, Something like that, that is a very good idea. I yeah. Think, Prof. yeah, because I, and I yeah, 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 I think uh, I, I've, I've seen uh, one of uh, the uh, sort of program in our government, which is provide us uh, a grant for collab international collaboration. Oh, I that's, think that's very good. Yeah, we, I think we, I've seen one program of uh, 
research collaboration, international research collaboration. We can develop so, the proposal together, and then we. That's right. Yeah, yes. and then we submit, and uh, we we can start the the experiment uh, separately. Meaning, you do your part in your university. My, my I do my part in my university, and then yeah. Let's say if it's uh, two different experiment with. Um, um complete data we can produce two two uh, uh articles with i mean uh, uh in your part also carry my name in my part also carry your name so that this is how we strategize as a lecturer because it's not easy <laughs> yes. to, yeah to, to perform as a lecturer these days very high kpi from the university okay so see this is a very good opportunity for uh, those uh, for us the the university the, the uh, lecturers to have a collaboration with the research center of professor rosita yeah um okay um is there any um anyone so it seems like <laughs> everybody hungry uh, <laughs> yeah, this is probably Professor Rosita. Okay, I guess uh, when there's no question anymore, uh, we are earlier about 10 minutes, Professor Rosita, from the time, but it's 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 fine. I guess uh, all the lecturer are uh, were delivered in a very good way and successful. Uh, make us all. Uh, have an improvement of the knowledge. Uh, so for the last uh, word, probably you want to uh, have a close, man, a close statement, Professor Rosita, for this first lecture before we um, I think um, understanding the fundamental knowledge, I mean, of something is very important because only when you have a strong fundamental knowledge that you can uh, um, do better on other things. Uh, um, like in our field, if if we have like very strong fundamental knowledge in the biology of the fish, everything physiology, easy for us to understand and to to expand or or to what do you call to to uh, explain in our discussion in our in our research why the why the when the what what happened easy for us to explain uh, uh, when we. Um, when we uh, investigate a, a problem or something, because if we don't have a strong fundamental knowledge, uh, uh, when we do some experiment, we want to answer uh, uh, what happened. It doesn't work the way we plan it. Like we, it, the hypothesis is not uh, uh, right. Uh, if yeah. we don't have yeah fundamental knowledge, is is going to you know. Um, uh, be difficult. That's why I yeah. always uh, want to, to um, uh, my student to have a strong fundamental knowledge first, then only easy for you to, to carry out your research and then to plan, to, to design the experiment. Uh, why is it like that? Why do you design like that? Like, I think most of the students ask, why is it like that? Why is the, 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 the yeah, hallmark the like that? Right, yeah. so understanding yeah, right. the, the fundamental, the basic is very important for us to answer in our result, in the findings. How do we justify why is the result is like that? We expect it turn out to be A, but it turn out to be B or something Z, very far from our expectation. So yeah. only with the uh, fundamental knowledge, uh, like I said, aquaculture student. Uh, the, the most of us are the uh, the the person with a biology uh, strength, not like uh, so much on other like uh, maybe some uh, good in chemistry also, but mostly we are biology person. So this is the basic for our uh, uh, what I call fundamental uh, knowledge. So I guess uh, that's all from me. I uh, will see you again tomorrow and. Um, because the lecture is quite long, I try to see whether I can add on some more <laughs> slides to my slot tomorrow and see. I think these days uh, with online system, uh, it's very hard for the student to absorb if it's too long in one go. So maybe, yeah, so, yeah. yeah we will have some 
rest in the middle and then I will yes. find some uh, videos that can, you know, just uh, try to unwind a bit with the so many uh, write up on the slides, something that, yeah, I, I try my best to, to, to make it more alive, like a, a normal physical uh, lectures. Uh, I know it's not easy to follow a four hour or three hour lectures. <laughs> Hi, my yes, I this is what, I, <laughs> what I have in mind as well, <laughs> Professor. Yeah, oh, yeah. But, yeah. Oh, okay, uh, Professor uh, Rosita, thank you so very much for this uh, first lecture. So if I uh, may just uh, make just a very uh, brief summary of what your lecture today. Yeah, basically, um, physiology is the scientific study of how component part of the fish um, function together. So in comparative uh, physiology this morning, Professor Rosita tried to explain to us how uh, so many different types of fish uh, had different uh, type of component work and also then at the end will affect uh, its uh, physiology process. And uh, the second is, um, you know, that um, basically uh, Professor Rosita is a nutritionist with very long time experience in, his, in her research. So I really encourage students who are really in, uh, interested in this topic to take this advantage uh, in this togetherness. So don't don't uh, waste the time. Uh, we have a very uh, reputable uh, keynote speaker. So uh, help you, I hope all the students can take advantage of this. Yeah. And the third, uh, Professor Rosita already uh, opened an, an opportunity for collaboration with our uh, faculty or our departments. So hopefully in the future, we will have a chance to to, um, to do this uh, collaboration together, which will very uh, good, yeah? I think uh, especially um, in the research collaborations. And last but not least, uh, for those students, I think to have a very strong fundamental knowledge is very important if you are really uh, getting into a research uh, experience later. So please be, wise with it <laughs> thank you so very much professor uh, rosita thank so you, um, i hope uh, we will um, i think tomorrow we will meet again and you still will be with me <laughs> and also with the same students i hope you will endure it until the end of your <laughs> session with us uh, uh, four days or even five In days on time no harsh yeah. okay uh, thank you so very much so i close this um first guest lecture thank you very much everybody uh, if the, uh, this is some uh, goodness it will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it, if it is bad it's just from me myself uh, see you uh, wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah assalamualaikum warahmatullahi yeah, tapi wabarakatuh tunggu istirahat matanya. so I give it back to the uh, host uh, Pak Dailami uh, maybe uh, there's a, a photo session, Pak Dalami, uh, probably uh, for this first uh, lecture. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Prof. Rosita, probably you can close the, um, uh, the, the, the share. Okay, maybe uh, we can have like a photo session, Pak Dalami. Yes, uh, all participants, if you don't mind, please open your camera so we can take a photo session. We have to part here. We will wait for others. Maybe I'll we'll just prepare the camera. Okay. Hello, uh, participants. Please uh, turn on your camera for a while. So we will have a photo session. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will take a picture for the first slide. One, two, three. And the second one. One, two, three. The last one. One, two.
two, three. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, dear all students, dear colleagues, dear participants. <laughs> thank you, see so, you again tomorrow. Yeah, we will have a lecture probably. Uh, uh, I will just share. Um, would you mind share the um the the slide that you have, uh, Prof Rosita? So uh, okay, hang on. The schedule so yeah. the students yeah. will um okay. uh, or I will. But mine is a bit different. I hope I am afraid it will be more difficult for students to. Okay. Um. Can you see? Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. We will see you tomorrow. Yeah. It's we'll seven thirty, right? Your time seven thirty, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I will see everybody on seven thirty tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Rosita. Thank you, Bumi. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you, Prof. Rosita. Thank you, Septi. Thank you, Daliami. Thank you, Prof. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Uh,